G'day everybody and those for those for those who are coming late, you're listening to Expand the Phantom Podcast. This is episode ninety nine. Yes, ninety nine. And today we have the interview with the crew from Herms Press. We have publisher Dan Herman and Sabrina Herman. And my name is Jermaine and before we introduce ourselves to them, let's uh, check the team, the Chronicle Chamber team, and see if Stephen has joined us. <laughs> no, Stephen hasn't joined us. In all guests. seriousness, <laughs> yeah, it's all it's a guess. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, he's got a funeral tomorrow, so he just wants to make sure he's in the right frame of mind. So our our thoughts uh, go out to Stephen and um, uh, the families that are involved with the funeral. Never a fun moment, and. Um, uh, as much as we all love the fandom, family and stuff like that is more important. So uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, but we have Dan. How are you, mate? Yeah, good, Jim, and uh, very much looking forward to this because I have loved watching uh, Dan Herman's uh, YouTube uh, videos over the, over time, uh, plugging the, the various books that uh, are coming out, and so really looking forward to uh, the conversation. Based, I do. I do have to pull you up on one thing, and I, and maybe this is a great way to to get Dan and, and Sabrina in. I've always thought that it was Hermes Press. You've said Herms Press. Can we can we clarify that right from the get go? Yeah, it's the Hermes Press. It's named after the Greek god Hermes, who is the bringer of dreams. Excellent. And if anyone, if anyone ever watched Jason and the Argonauts, which is the the Ray Harryhausen Jason and the Argonauts, there's a line where uh, Jason is talking to Hermes, who's disguised in his human form, and he looks down and says, uh, 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 Hermes, and Hermes thinks he's been discovered, and he says, yes, and he says, no, the statue of the god Hermes, and Hermes says, ah, yes, bring your dreams, wanderer in the night. So I always liked that quote. So when I created Hermes Press 20 years ago, I invoked the name of the Greek god Hermes, there you okay. go. There's the origin. There's the origin of the name of Hermes Press. Now, the other problem that we have is that um, we've got two people called Dan. Now, um... <laughs> That's not a problem. That's a good thing. Well, exactly. I just call him DH, so you can always do that. Okay, cool. DH. Is that all right? You can call me, as long as you don't call me late for dinner, that's fine. DH is fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, DH. All right. Um, well, I was just going to tell uh, Dan Fraser that he had to change his name. You're a special <laughs> guest, so you get to know you I'll, get your I'll name. I'll be Steve and, um, for today, perhaps. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll call you Steve today. <laughs> All right. So um, now, so you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Dan, uh, about you, how you became a fan, how you became a collector, and then go into uh, history and publishing, and then uh, and then we can get into a bit of uh, questions about Hermes Press. And then also, oh. Sabrina, yourself as well, uh, if you're a collector or whether you're <laughs> just yeah. whether you're just basically uh, brought along for the ride and that. So just give us a little bit of a, uh, a bit of a brief uh, bio of yourselves. That would be great. All right. Well, first of all, Sabrina is the managing editor of Hermes Press, and she's been with the company as long as I have and uh, knows all the same people that I do and has been involved in the comic book world virtually all of her um, adult and uh, all of her life, actually. Um, I am a publisher, and I take that very seriously because we publish, uh, people don't realize this, a rather wide range of uh, archival reprints, <coughs> comics, different comic book reprints, and we do books that range from The Phantom, which is uh, my favorite uh, property that we have licenses for from King Features, to Garfield, also known as Garfield the Cat, mm -hmm. to uh, yep. Brenda Star to uh, Mandrake the Magician, we did Mandrake the Magician uh, reprints, to uh, Dick Tracy. And uh, we have a really broad range of stuff that we publish, including art books. We just did a book on DC Comics before Superman, which was uh, written by Nikki Wheeler Nicholson, whose grandfather created National Allied Periodicals, which became DC Comics. So we've been involved in the comic book and comics world for over 20 years now. <laughs> is one of my all-time favorite strips. And Sabrina actually grew up watching Phantom 2040. Ah. Which I, uh, which yeah, I, I did as well. Yeah, I actually uh, like Phantom 2040 a lot. That's not yep. necessarily a consensus. I think it was a very intelligent, very well-done take on the Phantom. And irrespective of what a lot of fans think, I still like it very much. But um, when I was growing up, which was in the 60s, uh, 
you know, you would go into the drugstore because that's where you bought comic books. Didn't have comic book stores back then. They had drug stores and newsstands. And I lived across the street from a drugstore. And you would go in and you would see these incredible gold key Phantom comic books with these George Wilson covers on them. And, of course, we were buying DC. I, I wasn't buying too many Marvel comic books, but I was buying Gold Key. And, uh, and as a fact, what most people don't realize is Gold Key Comics and Dell Comics sold more than Marvel and DC combined because they had licenses for Walt Disney stuff, which sold way more than superheroes did. But getting back to the Phantom, uh, I saw those covers, and unless you uh, uh, are, are not paying attention, uh, and and you, if you look at those covers, you immediately have to have that book. You must buy that comic book. And those were the uh, the, those were the Lignanti. We, uh, you know, he even signed them because back in those days they didn't sign comic books. Carmen Infantino did, and Gil Kane did, and some of the artists were allowed to. Kurt Swanner did Superman for DC. Never got to sign his books back in the. And Mike Sikowski did Justice League. Did neither. But Bill Lignanti got to sign his books. Uh, for Gold Key, and they just dragged me in. And yeah. uh, I then was reading uh, at that time, which was the, the 62, 63, 64, um, I was reading the Cyberry version of the Phantom, the, the Cyberry Lee Fox version of the Phantom in the, in, the, uh, in the comics, in the newspaper where we lived. And, you know, back in the Stone Age, back in the 60s, you couldn't go and get reprints of mm. uh, some McCoy stuff or the Ray Moore stuff, or or you could you couldn't look at it. it didn't exist you couldn't get it you know collectors you know who were older were getting it so um, you know I was comparing the Phantom to the DC superheroes because I really wasn't into the Marvel heroes that much I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail over that <laughs> but uh, you know I was you know I like the Green Lantern and I like the I like the Gil Kane stuff and I and of course that. And uh, Batman, in some respects, is similar to the Phantom in that he's human and he's vulnerable, uh, which makes him more interesting. But uh, the Phantom has a has a really diverse backstory uh, with, with the can with the, the canon of the Phantom and the Phantom Chronicles, which you were getting in the DC Comics, or rather in the, in the Gold Key Comics, the Western publishing version, because they were basing a lot of the stories on the strips, which I didn't know. So I got sucked in at an early age, and I always liked the Phantom. And when uh, we started reprinting comic strips, which was a long time ago, uh, which was actually at the beginning of the 2000s, 2002, we started doing reprints. Mm -hmm. So that would be 16 years ago. Um, the Phantom was at the top of my list. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I wasn't able to get the license until uh, five or six years later. Uh, you know, my sister was in a very bad accident, and I was responsible for taking care of her. And that was, as you said, family is very important, and my interests were diverted to taking care of my sister mm -hmm. because my parents were very old and my sister wasn't married. So that kind of uh, put a lot of things I was doing on hold for a while. But then we got back on track, and one of the first properties I went after, uh, when the, re the reprint revolution started, I was already in it before it started because we wanted to archivally preserve comic strips so that people could yeah. have like the entire thing in their collection. And what I mean by that is starting from the beginning. And the Phantom was a real challenge because getting the first three or four years of material was very difficult. But mm -hmm. uh, I got a license um, in 2000, I want to say early 2009. And we didn't come out with the books until 2010. Because I was running around calling everybody all over the world trying to get the best <laughs> strips that I could get to do the first volume. And a lot of people were not happy with the first volume because it wasn't perfect. And the reason it wasn't perfect is because you can't get proofs for the first five or six months of the Phantom. Now, I don't, if they exist, nobody told me about it. So I you, went just did, you just did all of those off scans of old newsprint, is that right? Correct, correct. It, it, it was it was incredible. Um, we, we went, and at that time, Ed Rhodes was still alive, and uh, who was fantastic. And he talked about uh, and 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 we went to uh, Sardi's because they had Friends of the Phantom dinner, and we were invited. And I brought some of my Buck Rogers reprints to show them, and I sat with Siberian. He said, "Well, these are really good." Hmm. And I said, "You know what? My Phantom is going to be better." <laughs> and 
we, we actually for the first strip in the first book, we use three different sources and those panels are from like three or four different, three different strips. We actually cut them up and put them together to get the best image in each panel. Oh, wow. Because we, yeah, we were using tear sheets and, and with some of so the stuff. Could, sorry, gonna, sorry, just to cut in. Um, for, for a lot of, a lot of listeners, uh, they, what they've seen who don't have your books are probably the free comic books. Right. And so, and then they don't, a lot of, a lot of people don't understand tear sheets, microfilm and stuff like that. So could you just give us a, a brief, like a, a dummy's guide for those who don't know what these sources are and then well, how you, yeah. Well, that, that's a really good question because I, I talk to the people at King Features a lot because of our licenses. And, um, and one of the questions that comes up frequently when I have meetings with them is, how do you have all this material? <laughs> and the answer is because we go all around the world. Sabrina actually flew mm -hmm. down to Atlanta to get somebody's entire collection. A couple uh, years ago. Yeah, yeah and we which had is why. all the stuff for the Phantom Sundays Volume 4 that we were missing. And five. Okay, and well. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have virtually a complete set of all the Cyberi stuff which we either own or we borrowed from people. But getting back to your question, which is a good question, uh, when um, a newspaper strip is done, um, it's done you know, as in full size, which is usually six by 18 or seven by 20 or something <laughs> like that. When Cyberi was doing them in the 70s, he made the, the strip of the, the size of the strip smaller, but it's done in pen and ink, and then it's photographed. And then with dailies, they just photograph them and they knock out the background color so it's just pure black and white. Mm -hmm. And then they take those things, which were printed on a high gloss uh, coated stock paper, and they send them around to the newspapers, which, I don't, you know, not too many newspapers are in comic strips anymore. Everything's digital now. But in, in, the, old, in the good old days, they would take those, those, those uh, press proofs, is what they're called, mm -hmm. and they would send them to the newspapers who would then uh, merely just strip them in and then photograph them and make a negative and they would run the newspaper. And King Features did not keep King Features who syndicated the Phantom. Mm. As with most syndicators like Tribune, which uh, syndicated uh, Lil Orphan and Annie and uh, Brenda Starr and Dick Tracy. And uh, in the United Media and uh, Associated Press and different companies, you know, George Matthew Adams syndicate, all these different syndicates were uh, were syndicating comic strips. They didn't keep anything. King Features, King Features, however, did keep, to a great extent, most of their proofs. Let me emphasize most of They didn't keep oh, all of them for various reasons. I don't think it was purposely done. I just think they walked out or, or they weren't organized properly. They got lost in their libraries. They don't have uh, color proofs of anything. They don't even have set. They have some. We have separations. We have we have the separations for the later stuff, which means we have the the the, the cyan, the yellow, and the magenta, and the black separations for the, some of the Cyberry Sundays, which would be very interesting because we'll be able to print them and they'll be perfect. But that's mm. in the future. But what King Features did is they microfilmed all of their black and white material, which would include. The Phantom. It would also include Johnny Hazard, which we also reprint. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and 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 a lot of the strips. King, King Features came out with, with dozens and dozens of strips. King Features syndicated uh, Steve Canyon, even though they didn't own it. They syndicated it. We reprinted Roy Rogers, which they syndicated, but they didn't own. Roy Rogers owned it. But what they did uh -huh. with the Phantom, they 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 microfilmed the proofs, and the problem was. <laughs> They circulated them, and they used them, and people used them, and they got pulled and distorted and overused. And the other problem yes. is, yeah, microfilm, the other problem is microfilm is not very high resolution for reproduction. Mm. It's not. Now, very, they, go ahead. Micro, microfilm. So is, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm trying to remember back to my, is that the stuff in the old libraries it was kind of like a, a like a negative version. You had this big screen, and right. you would yeah. go use this, and then you know you would yeah. use yeah. It was like a negative sort of thing, and you would use it was on a big screen at, at libraries to kind of look mm -hmm. at newspapers back in the day. Is that when you say microfilm? Microfilm is that what it is? 
That's what it is, yeah. Yes. And, and the thing is, it's, it's on spools. And yes. at, at a certain point, King Features, it's my understanding, I have not seen this, but actually, I know they have this stuff. What they did was they scanned the microfilm. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. And, and, and they reversed it, so it's got a positive image. And, yeah. uh, and, and the quality of that stuff goes all over the place. And I don't mm. think they have a complete set of everything. We uh, received a request from Egmont a couple of years ago. Mm. They, they were running some original strips and something. And they said, you know, the stuff that King Features has, you know, really isn't what we want to use. Can you give us some of uh, your uh, scans? To which I said, absolutely. And we just gave them the scans. Uh, my policy is with, uh, with, uh, with Fru in Canada, Canada, in Australia, with Fru and Egmont, if they want something, we just give it to them as a yeah. courtesy. Yeah, it, it is, really. I mean, we get, and the only thing they're interested in is that we get it. So we can use it. You know, Ivan Patterson in, in the Norway um, is extremely generous in helping us when we're missing pieces. And yes. he's got very, uh, uh, very, if Ivan, if you go to Ivan, like with the Sundays we were doing, and we were saying, we can't get these Sundays in half pages. We can only get them in third pages. And Ivan would say, you know, to Troy Musquare, who's my production manager, ain't going to get them. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. remember they're very hard to get. So when Ivan tells you you can't get something, that's a pretty definitive source. You know, you go to yeah. Ivan, if you, you're going to have a problem getting it, Ivan's the definitive source on those things because he's, you know, looked at the stuff for I don't know how many years. But, you know, you go to him, and if he says you're going to have a you're gonna have a problem, I can guarantee you he's right. But anyway, so they had the yeah. microfilm. And it, it's been scanned, and they have that, and then they have the tear. And the tear sheets are different because tear sheets are what little boys and girls tear out of the newspaper, uh, which is second generation shot off the press proof, and then you're 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 captive to the printing quality of the newspaper because mm -hmm. newspapers would print the strips small if they didn't have enough space, or they print them yeah. a little, and then a lot of newspapers would do a less than perfect job printing them in the first place. So the zipatone dots that were used mm -hmm. don't out and the lines don't all reproduce the way we would want them to. Like colored by a five year old. Yeah, and then here's here, here's the big problem, which people mm -hmm. don't understand. We we, we, we you know, I, I've stopped explaining this, but I'll explain it. People say, Oh, you know, it doesn't have the same feeling as when I looked at it in the uh, in the newspaper. Well yeah, because the reason is newspapers don't print black. Newspapers yeah. print dark gray because mm. it, because first of all they're only printing in one color and second of all they're printing on a pulp and the pulp has a very high absorption rate so the ink is absorbed into the pulp paper so it doesn't sit on top of it and it doesn't reproduce exactly a hundred percent of the black ink that's being used and they only use one color black anyway whereas mm. for instance uh, if you really print black you print it for color black, CMYK black, and it looks more luscious. If you look at the blacks in the Sundays that we print, the black is different than just a flat black because it's got all of the colors on it. And, and, and a lot of people have said to me, why don't you print uh, your, your reprints on uh, you know paper that's more like a newspaper? And the answer is because we're trying to approximate the proofs which are closer to the originals. The only yeah. book that we on that with is is and you, you may be familiar with this. We did a humongous book, which which I will get. Pardon me. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I didn't. I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. I didn't have one available here, but I did this book here, which is really big. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. yes, I've got yeah. that one. Oh, yeah, this, book, yeah. this book was actually done. Uh, this was one of my pet projects to actually recreate virtually the exact same thing you would have seen in 1939 when you bought the Sundays. And these are full-size half pages of the Phantom Sundays. And they were printed on a wood-free paper, a very uh, a very uh, heavy wood-free paper, to simulate the feel of a newspaper. It's like a so, four-pound so, book. So, yeah, so, so the, the ink absorption on this is a little less than it would be on the regular Sundays because the ink is absorbed into the paper, whereas with our normal reprints, it's a good stock, not a gloss-coated stock. And what happens is it sits on top of the paper instead of being, it, it, there's some absorption, but it's very minimal. 
so all of the colors uh, kind of jump out at you. So yeah. you're going to get you're you're going to get a much more uh, accurate reproduction, which is going to look more like the proof that was shot mm. that was sent to the newspapers, which is which yeah. is what we're trying to do. I so um I opened that up with my comic book shop when I brought mine, and um and they they were amazed at just the quality, the largeness of it and stuff like that. So, you know, this is a comic book shop that deals with a lot of stuff. And um, he actually ended up uh, ordering a second one for himself. So uh, he got one in for me and then he got, you know, after we looked at it together, he ended up getting himself another one. Oh, thank you. Now, this book, actually, if you were to take, I think I did it in, I don't know if I did it in my video, but if you were to take the um, actual tear sheets, you know, I, these are done from tear sheets. They're not done from proofs because we can't find any proofs yeah. of the Sundays. But if you took the tear sheets and you compared them um, and you looked at these things, these actually look better because they had pieces missing um, because the person that collected this collection, when he was a little boy actually, cut them out and pasted them on larger pieces of paper and then put them in a huge book. And he was clipping them sometimes because he was using, you know, like the scissors that we all use when we're in second grade. Uh, he would clip into the margins. So the way, yeah. we fixed that, the way we fixed that was we have all the black and white press proofs. Uh, we have actually virtually all of them for the Sundays. So we would overlay the black and white press proof digitally over the missing area and seam it in. So oh, we yeah. weren't really you know, we weren't redrawing it. We were actually using the original black and white. Mm. And then was, we would clone, yeah, we would clone stamp in the color so it would match. Oh, because so clone stamp. You, so you do use Photoshop uh, in in that way. Is that is that the program that you're using? It would seem easier, you know, to to the uneducated non-publisher uh, to just draw the the line in where the perhaps the scissors have come on. But uh, I, I, I agree. But because I am annually accurate. And because I have the press proof, <laughs> um, I'm not going to mess around. So I have the press proofs. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we had big discussions about should we do the press proofs or the color. And I said, if you've seen the color, the answer is you gotta, you got to do the color strips. I mean, yeah. IDW, which is a very fine company and does a lot of reprints, uh, is doing Dick Tracy, and, and they did the, uh, the Sundays in black and white. And actually, Dick Tracy looks very good in black and white. Uh, and some people said, well, I didn't use the color. I don't know the reason, but I suspect it was maybe because they had a problem getting a complete set and they had all the proofs uh, because uh, I think they did. They had the proofs, so it was easier for them and it looked better and it was more consistent uh, because when they did Terry and the Pirates, they did it in black and white and color because it's a continuity strip. So you, do, uh, you have to do the Sundays with the dailies. When we did the Phantom, I think it was volumes eight and nine. Uh, the Sundays run in continuity with the dailies. Nine and, nine and ten, I think. Nine and ten, okay. And they and they and they run in continuity. So uh, you know, we had to figure out how to do that. I mean, it's easy. We just had to pull them out. So the Sunday books are missing that year because it's in the dailies book. Yeah. Because mm. make any sense to run the Sundays because they'd be incoherent. This is a, this is a this thing is... that Jermaine's been on about for years, to be honest. <laughs> that, because there's four stories, isn't there, where the dailies and the Sundays sort of Merged yeah. together. Now, Dan, you're with me on this one. Um, with and I've actually, there's actually been a bit of a, a toing and throwing with a couple of people in through letters and also uh, where they reckon that they're separate stories. Now, you're with me that they're they're the one story. Isn't that correct? Oh, absolutely. No, they they yeah. were they yeah. were they were. So cool. who was it? Bob I'm somebody. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 what you gotta do is read them. Now, what they did, yes. though, yeah. what they did was they they did the Sundays in such a manner that you could probably read them without the daily. Yes, you could, and, and, and they'd make sense. I mean, we just reprinted Dark Shadows, which is an entirely different universe, and Dark Shadows only ran for a year. And the way they set Dark Shadows up. You could actually read the Sundays, and they kind of made sense without the dailies. But they made a lot more sense if you read all yeah. the dailies and the Sundays because, you know, you don't always read the dailies. But yeah. the thing is, the story makes a lot more sense if you read all of yeah. it together. And, totally uh, agree. 
And I mean, I read it and, and uh, you know, I wasn't going to break it up. And I, I didn't think it would, I thought I would be doing it. I would be doing a disservice to the Phantom yeah. by breaking, by breaking it up and running the Sundays only as Sundays and leaving yeah. the daily out. And yeah. uh, both arguments can be made and it was set up so you could do one without the other. But if you really want to read the story and, and, and it's a lot more fun to see it, the way I reproduced it, the way Hermes Press did. Mm. And it's a question of historic accuracy. I believe that it was designed that way, um, you know, and, uh, you know, in a perfect world, I would only produce Sundays that had half pages. Yeah. But we don't live in a perfect world. We got some flack on the fourth volume because we ran the black and white. Uh, and, and here's what, what really got me is I wrote an introduction and it said, listen, we We've been looking all over the place for these things, and and I'm not uh, I'm not engaging in hyperbole. I mean, we went to Ivan, we went to people in New Zealand and Australia and Sweden and Denmark, and Norway, and Europe and the United States. Uh, and then there's always that guy that says, "Why didn't you ask me?" Yeah. So I'm yeah. on your podcast. If you've ever got anything, even if you think we have it. Thank email you. us because we want to do the most complete uh, reprint of this strip that's ever been done. And so far, I think we're doing a decent job on it. Well, well uh, just the way that you talked about, you know, cloning from and merging two different images <laughs> to get the best one and taking panels from, you know, this panel's not quite good enough. I like this panel better. Um, it certainly sounds like, um, yeah, you know, you're not prepared to just draw in a line because that's you know where that's kind of where Ray Moore or Wilson McCoy would have put it. You want the actual line that they put in there. That's no, that, that, that's exactly right. And the thing is, is that with the Fourth Sundays, well, I'll, I'll tell you a, kind of a funny story. When we did the, uh, I think it was the second Phantom book for Sundays, and uh, I couldn't get all half pages, and I was pretty upset about it. And um, the book was done, and I canceled it. And I said, we're not going to do it. We're just going to have to wait until we get half pages. Oh, so, my, for my, so my ever, ever vigilant uh, and, and really super a production manager, Troy Musquire, who everybody who deals with Hermes Press knows Troy, uh, looked at me and said, are you an idiot? <laughs> I mean, it's all done. It looks really good. And so I consulted with, uh, I consulted with some people. Um, I called Renee White. And I said, Renee, you know, what do you think? And Renee said, do it. Just print it. Because it, it, explain, everyone will understand. I said, I'm going to explain. I'm, I'm a little dubious about it because I want to reproduce all the half pages. And I, I talked to some other people. Renee was, was very good and, and said, they'll understand. So we did it. And we got a little flack, but not too much. And I don't regret it because it would not have been done and you wouldn't have it. And the, the more, look at this. I, I remember going to the Friends of the Phantom, uh, you know, a thing at Sardi's and saying, you know, give me your material, please. And they looked at me and we said, you, uh, you, you were there, Sabrina was there. And yes, I said, we will drive said, wherever we road. need to go. Yeah, God, I'm sorry, go ahead. You oh, there? I said, we'll drive wherever we need to go. Like, Atlanta, yeah. Florida, whatever. No, I mean, actually, we, you know, we drove up to the one guy's collection in Michigan and spent three days scanning Sundays. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that we'll go. You know, now, let me just also uh, give a plug to Randy Scott, who is the uh, director. He's the he's the head of special collections at Michigan State University, my, my alma mater in East Lansing, it. Michigan. Two, two great uh, universities in the United States have huge collections of, uh, of the proofs, the King Features proofs, because they were given to two universities. They were given to Ohio State University and to Michigan State University. And yeah. Randy Scott controls the, the Michigan State University collection and has permitted us to go in and scan or copy uh, the complete uh, proofs that they have, which they got from the King Features. So when you look at the books that we're putting out now, which are maybe ninety or hundred percent, ninety-nine or hundred percent proofs, mm. incidentally have to be digitally redone anyway, yeah. because they're they're far from perfect, but they're about as perfect as you can get. And 
we then clean them up and make them better. Yeah. Wasn't for Michigan State, I wouldn't be able to do Johnny Hazard or the Phantom because we're using yeah. their material. And IDW has gone and gotten material. They got their uh, uh, Rip Kirby stuff from them. Rip Kirby was a strip that Alex Raymond did. And they've got a lot of material from them, too. Everybody has. And then you go to Ohio State for stuff, too. And Ohio State is very good about allowing people access to their collection. But Michigan State's is more organized. Actually, we helped them organize it. Them. We actually went in. Uh, we brought a lot of people down, and we actually went through their stuff. So, okay. you can um, find Random. Them. Yeah. Another random question. With, um, did you find like when you get stuff like your tearaway sheets and even your microfilm and all that, it were there any ever any edits to the original pages in those? Like, because I know with, I know especially with free comics back in the probably in the forties and fifties, there was a lot of sensitive material that was edited like girls had longer dresses on or um and stuff like that oh, and yeah like a, a yeah, kick became a punch and this sort of thing and i noticed well, even in well, the um and the reason i asked this question is in the first sing brotherhood story when sala stabs kabai sing if you actually look for that whole that whole uh process she actually changes clothes uh, um, so that was just, just made me wonder whether that was, um, like, you know, at first she's in something a little bit more skimpy and then as she's about to kill Kabai Singh, she's got a nice full winter gown on, which covers, you know, head to, uh, head to ankles. So I was just, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I have an answer for you. Um, first of all, um, in the United States, if you look at the proofs, they differ from uh, material that was distributed in Europe. Yeah. Because they had different standards in Europe. And so King Features didn't change it. It was changed when it went over to different countries. It changed like okay. so, yeah. Right, so you have a modification in the material from country to country based on yeah. whatever their their Whatever problem. their guidelines are. Right, and there's, and there's another problem with strips in general from the war period and after the war period was that newspapers, they had, uh, they had you know, it was a terrible, and there were paper shortages, not to mention shortages and everything else, like gasoline and everything was rationed. Yeah. And yeah. Newspapers, had, newspapers had to cut down on the, uh, on the, on the, 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 uh, the funnies, the comic strips. So King Features and every other syndicate created two versions of every strip. If you've ever seen the original art, which actually I have, but I can't go grab it because it would take a while. But yeah. you'll see a piece of original art and it'll have a line running about maybe a quarter of the way up from the bottom. And it's a line that runs from end to end. It's actually somebody drew a line on it. And you'll see the indicia where it says whatever, King Features or Tribune or whatever. And, that, and, and they'll have two indicia strips, two indicia lines. They'll have one at the bottom of, of one panel and they'll have one on the line because that's where they were going to cut it when they okay. sent it to the different syndicates, to the different newspapers, rather. Mm -hmm. And so you get a version that's not as tall. It's not as, it's not as vertical. And yeah. we ran into that problem because King Features, for whatever reason, when they saved their proofs, did not save... The unedited, versions. Yeah, the unedited versions, all they did was they sort of saved the ones that were cropped. Yeah. So, yeah, so in some of our books, we were using tear sheets or newspapers where they didn't crop them. And mm. then we were using proofs where they did. And we were lining them up using a center line. So everything would look okay if you looked at it. But if you started to scrutinize it, you'd see that one strip was mm. actually vertical than the other. And we ran into that with a number of strip reprints we did, like with Johnny Hazard. We got a lot of whack on Johnny Hazard because we were using the King Features press proofs, which were the truncated versions. And people were just going crazy. Why don't you use the regular full size ones? Well, because I can't get a set up. Mm. Um, and we had tear sheets and we were running different ones on different pages. 
And uh, we're not the only company that runs into that problem because you're talking about stuff that's 70, 80 years yeah. old. And I uh, can't, you know, magically, you know, conjure up the stuff. I have to go with the best stuff that I can find. But, you know, to answer your question, is yes, it was censored. Yes, it was censored by country. It was censored in that country when they got the uh, the proofs. Yeah. The stuff that we have is probably the closest to the original because mm -hmm. most of it is sourced from the King Features material at Michigan State. So I've, so what do you have? I've found the I've found the pages. So it's on your first volume, page one twenty four. I'm not sure if you can oh. see that. Um, well, I'll go get it. Just wait a minute. Um, um, yeah. Have, so, I don't have. I have them all in my life. No, I don't have it. So, well, I'll show Sabrina and Dan while, uh, no, I'll show yeah, Sabrina I'll and Dan slash close. Steve. Do you? So, <laughs> I don't ever see my face that close. There's, uh, there's Sala in, you know, in Here's stuff me. like that. Yeah, I see. So you can see yeah. that. And then if we flip over the page, uh, we'll show, for those who are only listening to the podcast, we'll show actual example of this in the post and also on social media if you want to yeah. look at it later so and then there's her in mm. a full winter gown yes i see that she got cold real fast <laughs> yeah so in between of getting uh tied up and then killing cab i sang yeah that's time cool. to, well, you know as women we time to do all the time well i just wish that my wife took that that uh that quick to get changed that's a nice outfit. I like the first one. Uh, well, here's the thing. Okay, I'm going to research. I'm going to research this. So I'm, I'm actually going to go back and. Uh, he's the one that takes forever to get dressed. I'm going to go and look at the first on this. Of course, I'm a cosplayer, so. You know, I'm looking at this, so. 11, A11, let me see, 11. Unless there's, there's not a continuity issue because it's, it's, it's just, there's no sun there. That's a really interesting because this looks like it was. It doesn't look like it's doctored up. It'd be interesting to see what the original art looks like. It would. Uh, yeah. So yeah. one of the one that's really interesting is when you see the original art, which you you don't see from this period. Uh, it'll tell you a lot about what. For instance, I can tell you that I have original art where it's very different from what was printed. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that the people that would make any um, alterations would be at the syndicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. Because they had person. their own art staff back then, I believe. Oh, well. yeah, yeah. You know, so, like, yeah, they would have sent it in and then they would have gone, oh, no, like the editor, I was assuming the editor would have said, can we fix up this or something like that to make it flow better or all? Uh, and stuff like that as well. So, yeah, I'm assuming there will probably be a fair bit of um, uh, edits. Um, I have another question of regarding that book as well. So when you've – I think you're going to say something. So when we've finished that, I've got another panel I want to ask you about as well. <laughs> this is going to be a very long podcast. We're going to go through book by book asking <laughs> about – I can do that. that yeah, that's it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, okay. Well, all right, okay. so here's my panel here. So it's on page 31 and the top row, the third panel. <laughs> now, it's on the, for, the, uh, for those who do not see it, again, I'll show this now. If you look at the writing style, the writing style is different on that panel compared to the others. Yeah, now, that's true. It's absolutely true. Now, this was also in the – this and then also the other one I showed as well was also in the Fru 1128 because when I saw this, I actually got out the Fru one and compared them and, and stuff like that. I I think it was a slow football game or, a, uh, or something where I have a little be bit of – before kids. <laughs> yeah, before kids, before kids because I do not have that time now with two little rug rats. <laughs> but – um. Yeah, so I was just there, – there was two – they're the two kind of things that I'm interested in. So I'm assuming that this panel was um, – I don't, I don't know. It was, must have been sourced from like a, somewhere else and then the writing is different. Well, let, me, let me tell you something very interesting about the first four or five months of The Phantom, which you probably know. When Lee Fox created The Phantom um, – he didn't know who the fan was going to be. Yeah, uh, true. 
and 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 actually, the, the the gentleman who appears in the first strip, uh, I think it's the first Diana ship, we then used in in our uh, in our our comic book, uh, the one that Peter David wrote. He was yes, our Jim supposed Wells, yes. Fan. Yeah, he was supposed to be the Phantom, and as Lee Fox went along with it, he said, nah, I decided I don't want him to be the Phantom. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this differently. So yes. this, this strip was in a state of flux um, yeah. when it was being created initially because he didn't have a clear idea uh, where he was going with who the Phantom was going to be. And yeah. that, that might have some, some, some yeah. influence on the dialogue and how it was done, I don't know. And then the other problem is, is that you have issues with other people at the syndicate rewriting stuff or maybe mm -hmm. re-lettering it. Uh, and, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, again, I mean, the problem is I've seen, I've been collecting original artwork, comic strip and comic book original. I started collecting it when you would go into a comic book store in the uh, late 60s and they would have pages from Gil Kane's Adam inked by Murphy Anderson tacked up on a, on the bulletin board yeah. with thumbtacks. Oh, wow. And they would have a price of $2.50 on each page. Wow. And uh, things have changed since then. Yeah, and, and, yes. and, the way, and the way they got those pages was Julie Schwartz, who was the editor of the Adam and, and the editor at DC Comics who did Adam and Flash and uh, and, and later a Batman, um, uh, would send the stuff to people that would write letters. Uh, and they would get like, they wouldn't get the whole story. He would send them like the first uh, 13 pages or something. It was a two part where he'd send them six. And then they would sell them at the local comic book store, you know, for a dollar. Yeah. And that's, and that's how comic art came out. And so when I started collecting comic art, the first thing that I thought was incredible was that it was big. And it wasn't the size of the comic book because I assumed it was the same size. Then the other thing that I noticed was there were all kinds of changes on it, uh, yeah. and there were kinds of editing changes. And then the other thing I, I noticed was that sometimes it wasn't the same as what was in the comic book, and it's the same way with strips. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way. It's the same way with the Phantom. And um, if you look at the uh, uh, the proofs of some of the stuff, especially with the Sundays, which is easier with the Sundays, and you compare. To talk about comparing stuff, they, they did the Phantom. The Phantom was designed originally as a half page. It was not designed as a tabloid. The tabloid would be very, very vertical. And so yeah. what the King Features uh, staff did was they actually added on to the sides of all of the, of the panels on the oh. right side. And if you look at the, uh, you look at the, uh, because we have proofs of both. We have proofs of the half pages and of the tabloids. And you can see where they drew on the side. Yeah. This was not Ray Moore drawing on the side. As a matter of fact, it's pretty obvious because you can see where the lines yeah. don't actually line up properly where they're drawing in stuff. Um, but they were doing that. And, and they didn't do a third page until later on the Sundays. But they took, first of all, this was merely commerce at that time. And they did not attribute it to, and they did not attribute to it that it was it was storytelling that was going to be around a long time, which is why they didn't save anything. Because people ask me, why didn't they save it? Save it? And the answer is because this was merely commerce, which was not given any particular import by the people yes. that were publishing it. Mm. They had no concept that the people like Lee Clark were artists. And that Ray Moore was a storyteller, and that they were creating a because these these are myths in essence. Mm. These are our modern myths that they were creating myths that would live on much longer than the editors mm. and the publishers and the newspapers that were printing them. That they would live on much much longer, much like Hermes and the Greek gods, which yeah. are myths which people still think about and make movies about today. And and her story is important. I mean, the 20th century myths to a great extent, have become the comic book and comic strip stories that were created in the 20s, then the 30s, and the 40s, and then with yeah. the Silver Age in the 60s. And uh, is it art? No, it's not high art. Is it? Is it storytelling? Yes. Is it? It's apples and oranges. But yeah. you know, but so is I mean, it? So so yeah. is it that? Um, I guess. Uh, 
uh, non understanding at the time that this would go on to become um, you know highly regarded. Is that why there's so very little of, of Ray Moore's original art uh, still available now? It just wasn't hung on to. No one, no one sort of realised how valuable it would be down the track. I mean, Jermaine and I have had discussions. We feel like there's probably only, what, 10 to 20 pieces of original Ray Moore art, phantom art, left in the world that we can sort of identify. Um, for, for someone... Yeah, I was going to say, they're, they're interesting reasons. I've been collecting original art for a long, long, long time. And there are lots of reasons for that. For instance, I, I can tell you that they would just give it out. They would give it away. Um, mm. a fan would write in, or a fan would go down to uh, King Features, and they, and a lot of it was taken by the employees. Um, yep. and then, so the employees got it. Raymore didn't get it back. No. I, I will say that Lee Falk had had a lot of it. Yes. Lee, Falk, Lee Falk had a significant amount of artwork, which I don't know whether they still have it or not. I know they were liquidating. They liquidated a lot of it at a certain yeah. point. Lee Falk well, passed it. I know, I know, um, I don't know when, but it was, I think it was back in the 40s or 50s, there was an Italian publisher that mm. was publishing, uh, obviously you know the story as well, that yeah, was published and then Lee Fork sent over like, it was like a whole bunch of the original art. So in Italy somewhere it's either been thrown out or there's some, dusty warehouse or it could have been destroyed or something like that where, where there could be a lot of Ray Moore artwork. So you've heard that story as well? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's kind of like it's right next to the Ark of the Covenant. When you go, <laughs> that, when you go into that big where I'll, 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 I'll digress and tell you a very interesting story about that. First of all, you never know when artwork is going to show up. There's a very, very famous strip amongst people that really love comic strips called Scorchy Smith, which was published by the Associated Press. And one of the truly great artists to work in comic strips, uh, Noel Sickles, who yep. uh, was yeah. partners with Milton Kenneth and, and actually created Kenneth's style. And Kenneth uh, acknowledged that fr frequently. But the point is, is that uh, when, you, when I started collecting strip art, which was 40 years ago, you had to have a Squirchy Smith, but you couldn't get one because there weren't that many of them in existence, maybe 30, 40, something like that. And you, there was a very high premium to get a good one. A good one meaning it had all the characters in it and, and it was just one you wanted. Couldn't get them. About 15 years ago, I'm not exaggerating, somebody found a trunk. <laughs> she had about 1,100 of them in it. Oh, wow. Yeah, so and now they're worth got, nothing. And the, and the guy got it at an auction, and uh, and then he didn't know what it was, and uh, he found out real fast what it was, and it, it, it was it was insanity because uh, he put it up on eBay, and somebody bought it for I don't know it was like eight or nine thousand dollars, and this was nothing because these strips were selling for fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars each, and he's got you know like eleven hundred strips in there. Um, that was the figure I was told. And and everybody is screaming, well, he didn't sell it to the guy on eBay because somebody said to him, do you realize what you have? So um, a friend of mine, uh, art dealer, Mitch Itwitz, and I tried to buy them because we, we, we wanted to pick out the good ones and sell the rest of them. Mm. But we were aware of the fact that if we dumped them on the market, the price would just yeah. crash. Yeah. We, we didn't get them. Somebody yeah. else. Which we've seen in Phantom World. We've seen the market crash with even Cy Barrett and even Wilson McCoy. Like I, I know of a story of uh, a friend of mine and Dan slash Stevens where he paid, I think he paid like five, six hundred US for a, a Cy Barry daily, like back in the nineties. Right now, after uh, the Forker stake and stuff like that, you know, you can you can pick them up for you know less than two hundred dollars sometimes, and it's the same as even with the Wilson McCoys. Um, I remember back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a, a Wilson McCoy daily with no phantom in it, and that went for 800 US. Um, I picked up a Wilson McCoy daily with the phantom in one of the panels, and it cost me, I think it cost me 300 Australian to get it shipped to Australia. So we could, we've seen even that with phantom 
artwork where there's a lot more Wilson McCoy and Cy Barry than what there once was. Well, let me, let me, Phantom fan fans will love this story. Okay. So, um, I think it was 2012 or 2013. I don't remember. And I was at, because we do Comic-Con every year. We have a, Oh, yes, I remember yeah, this. Yeah, we've been doing Comic-Con for, this will be our 18th year next year. That's officially, unofficially, we've been doing it for way longer. Wow. But uh, one of the guys that works for me calls me on my cell phone, and he's uh, apoplectic. Yes. You have to come down to so-and-so's booth at the other side of the hall, because he has thousands and thousands and thousands, he's not exaggerating, of phantom mm. days. And I said... Pardon me. I'm coming. <laughs> Pardon me. And then I said, I have to leave. So uh, <laughs> I go running down. I go running down, and my this is uh, Brian Peck, who works for us. He's one of our special projects guys, and who's like six foot seven, Sabrina. Six no, he's foot like five. six foot four. They abandoned me, and they ran. Yeah. I mean, for, like, <laughs> oh no! I, I got their priorities. Yeah. I got their priorities. So, so, yeah, these I big plastic me. tubs that you get at the supermarket yeah. and they're filled with sequential phantom dailies mm. starting in 1957 or 58 or something are, are you and talking it, about newspaper clippings is that yeah no, i'm talking about the no, original, no, no, the original art. the original the art. Art. this, yeah, this is where i got art. this stuff right and and I, and I know the guy he's a dealer from the brooklyn and he's been around for a million years and i and we, we got there first because because Brian got there when he opened his booth, so we're standing there and there's this line of people, and we said, "No, we get to look at it all first. Mm -hmm. So um, they had split it amongst two dealers, and they had six or seven years. I mean, they had pieces missing because Lee Falk had given one or yeah, two pieces. pieces. Yeah, but but you had like maybe ninety five percent of the, the yeah. complete continuities, and you had. I mean, day, day after day after day of running dailies. So we're going through them all, and we're taking all the ones with Phantom in every panel. <laughs> <laughs> and we're stacking them up. And, um, and it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's insanity. We're there for like four hours. And, <laughs> the, and then the prices started to go down because they had all the stuff from the 70s still. And people were coming up to me. Hey, would you like to buy these twelve from the seventies? And I said, No, no, no. I'm only interested in the ones from the sixties uh, because you know I want the big ones, the ones from the seventies. Mm. Well, unfortunately, I can't give you a number, but from what I personally saw, there were probably two or three thousand yep. uh, right. uh, original dailies. They didn't have any Sundays. They were original dailies at Comic Con at one time. Yeah. And people were buying them and going crazy, and then the, they flooded out on the market. Yeah, that's where and, I got my two pieces from. Right, and 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 you know one of the things which you should never do is do that. Is, you should, yeah, what you yeah. Should, you should pieces out, and you and the reason is you're not doing collectors any favor by well, flooding the market. Yeah, you're, you're doing collectors with a budget like me a favor. Um, <laughs> but you're not doing um, you're not doing the the value of the of the art and stuff like that out of value. I think they have learned about that, like because we've talked about this with Cy si Barry previously when we had him on uh, the podcast. Uh, it's all kind of related to that, Dan. And um, it, um, I think they've kind of learned that you know you kind of have to not flood the market as much and and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, no, it's it's interesting to to hear that 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 story that I've heard very similar uh, from another source. So thank you for that. Well, you know, I'll tell you something though. At, once it's all out, yeah, then then it takes a while, but maybe eight or nine, ten years. But then the the, the market normalizes itself. Yeah. Yeah. I never yeah. bought, I, I never bought the art with the presumption that it had any value other than the fact that I really loved it. Yeah. Uh, I never bought it with the presumption that I would resell it because I rarely, if ever, sell a piece. Usually He's a only... black hole. I'm a black hole. He'll give some to me, but that's it. So oh, you're yeah, a she... collector first. Do you, well, do you have any of it? A collector first and a businessman second. 
Yeah, not even second. But I mean, the thing is, you get maybe fourth or fifth or yeah. later down the track. But you're a collector first, I guess. Is the, right, so the, the reason I get rid of a piece is because I'll have like, um, in one instance, I had a, an elongated man piece, which is a, a backup strip that ran in Detective Comics. And I wanted Kerman and Fantino pencils and inks. And I got oh, one that was... That'd be nice. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I mean, that's what I wanted. <laughs> and I, that's what I really, really wanted that. And I was able to get my hands on one that was later that was inked by Sid Green. And Sid Green was a very, actually a very fine inker, but it doesn't look like Carmine and Fantino's work. So I had that for years until I got my splash page that is Carmine and Fantino pencils and inks. That's perfect. And I didn't need the, I didn't need the other one anymore because I had what I wanted. So I gave it to my yeah. friend and sold it. So yeah, I would, I got rid of it, but I mean, you know, it, it's because I got it because it was the best I could do at the time. Yeah. And then I, yeah. what I was looking for. So I'll get rid of pieces after 10 years when I finally get the one that I want. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so as a collector then, how do you, do you have pieces, particular the favorite pieces that you frame up and put up on the wall or do you put them in a, you know, from a practical point of view, do you, do you have them in a folio that you can flick through or <laughs> stashed under your bed? Or, or how do you store all of this artwork that you've got? You should see his <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's a mess. First of all, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a mess. Yeah, 90%. You run over it. You walk over yeah. it. You trip over it. There's art. Yeah, 90, 90, 98% of my collection is stored in flat files. What in, in, yeah. in my in our sleeves, like this. Yeah, ninety-eight percent of it's stored. It's organized by artist uh, alphabetically, and it's all not by not by strip, but by artist. Okay. And yeah, because um, yeah, I, I collect by artist. I don't collect by by, by the title of the strip. Then um, I've lent a lot of stuff to different museums in the United States that, oh. that have used the collection because I have a fairly decent collection. And then there are only about uh, five pieces that are actually framed that you can actually see what you've done in my library. And they're uh, truly outstanding examples of the art of comic books. Yeah, of comic book storytelling. I'll tell you a couple of them. I have the first uh, Joker cover, the original art for the first Joker oh, cover. Oh, wow. 62. Jerry Robinson, Pencils and Inks. It's called the Balloons Cover. And I have a fantastic Jack Kirby, Vinnie Coletta, Thor Splash from uh, Thor 142. And then I have a Superman cover, Kurt Swan, from my generation. Kurt Swan, George uh, Klein, Superman cover from the early 60s. And, um, and I have some, and a couple of other pieces. But those are the pieces. And then on my floor here in my office, I've got all this sure stuff. That, yeah, then I got back from... Uh, <laughs> From the museum, over and it was framed, and I never took it out of the frames. Nope. So it's just sitting here in stacks. <laughs> um, and yeah. I'm looking at, yeah, what, I, what I'm looking at right now on my right is the original artwork for the cover to uh, Green Lantern uh, 26. <laughs> it's actually a pretty cool cover. It's the original art to this was in, um, this was in a I museum. Like um, he was in, he was here, I'll put him in, it was in the, uh, wait a minute. Jewish. It, uh, says right here on the back, yeah. It was in the, uh, Colum, blah, 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 Reflecting Culture, the Evolution of American Comic Books, Superheroes, uh, 2000, 2007, 2008, Montclair Art Museum in uh, New Jersey. So this is the way I got it back. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. it's got the full borders underneath there. It was not cropped. They just matted it. So I've got all this stuff laying around here, um, you know, because I don't want to take it out of the frame because it no, looks nice. Yeah, it's just a floor here. So I framed it for free for you. So you just got to leave it like that. Um, so if you ever run out of room and you need to offload or you need to lend some more stuff, um, mate, I can got, give you my personal address. you've got address, no so space right? in your place. <laughs> I, I've got a I'll few make walls. room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, um, do you, uh, just a couple of random questions uh, sure. about your collection. So I think, I can't remember if it was actually during the podcast or pre-podcast. I think you said you had around 10 pieces of Ray Moore. Is that around that? Yeah, is that... I, I have, uh, no, no I, I don't own any Ray Moore. No, I don't own any oh, Ray okay. Moore. I, 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 have, <laughs> I have scans of Ray Moore art to use. 
in books. No, I do not own a piece of Raymore art because it is it is impossible to get. Yeah. Um, and the last time a piece came up um, was in a heritage auction, which was a pretty nice daily, if I do say so myself. And I was uh, actually, I'm embarrassed to say, I wasn't aware that it was for sale. And I missed the auction. And it was quite pricey. I think it went for 10,000 US dollars. I think and I actually it, know the person who brought that. It's a, it is a, it is an outstanding mm. piece. And it's, and, and we have a scan of it and it's going to be in the art of the phantom, but it's an, it's an outstanding daily. And, yeah. uh, we got some other ones from people in Italy and there's somebody in Spain that has two Sundays and we have a full size scans of them. As a matter of fact, one of them is in this book. And uh, we reproduce it rather. Let me take out this plate here. But, you know, uh, I can't, I'm not allowed to divulge who owns it. Yeah. Uh, but here it is, actually. Here's the strip. And you can see how big this is. And that, oh, wow. we forget where that comes from, but I think it may be. I don't want to say and get it wrong and then get an email. You know, you're doing that correctly. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, and here's the, uh, wait a minute, I think we have the daily in here too. And in order to reproduce this thing, this size without getting it grainy, we have to have a pretty good scan of it. There's, yeah. the, uh, mm. there's the daily. And, um, oh, that's you know, a nice so, one. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're very nice. As far as Ray Moore is concerned, I would love to have one. But I don't think I'm getting one anytime soon because they're very rarely available. Uh, yeah. Period. I mean, you know, it's kind of like I I really love Don Newton's stuff, and his his Phantom stuff is really hard to get a hold of. Yes. Because uh, everybody owns it, and they're and no not. No one wants to give it up. <laughs> no, I mean, I I have a page. Uh, I I have a Don Newton page, and it's a pretty good one. It's not fantastic, but it's it's there's one panel. It's really good. I have it here. I pulled it out. And, you know, Jim Opero also did the Phantom and did yes. some really nice work on it. And uh, there was one page in particular that I really, really liked, which is the second chapter Splash, which I was very aggressive about getting. And I did get it. But, uh, you know, Jim Opero's stuff has been out a while. Uh, very underrated, Jim Opero's work. Oh, his, his and he did great work on Batman. He did great work on Aquaman and Batman and the Spectre. And I was kind of uh, disappointed at the uh, Eisners this year because he was nominated for one of those awards for for you know being a really great artist, and he didn't get it. He didn't get the award. And I said to a couple of people, you know, Jim O'Pair really deserves this award. And they said, well, you know, it's going to take two or three times before he gets it. Mm. And and I said, well, he should get it because and I think Don, I think Don Newton equally should get one of those awards. Oh, definitely. Don Newton, it's his, his art is, and like you hear the stories about how quickly he did it all. And like, you know, he, he was very quick and, and stuff like that. His, um, yeah, his art's, his art's amazing. Um, uh, you know, I was appreciative of your Charlton reprint book that you released because, um, the Charlton original books and the ones that Fru published just didn't do it justice, um, like especially the covers and stuff like that. It was just muddy and yuck. Um, so yeah, he's, I was I was glad to see that. And I think I think a lot of for a lot of Australians, we probably haven't seen or appreciate a lot of the the, the Charlton stuff because. Um, not a lot of us, like Dan, you haven't seen a lot of Charlton stuff. You, you've, you don't collect those ones and you've only really seen the ones that have, um, Fru have been publishing just yeah, recently. Yeah, that's that right. I, I, I've missed the boat on those, um, uh, yeah, for, for, for various reasons and, uh, I haven't really chased them down and, uh, I've only seen the stories that Fru have, have, have republished, which are nice enough, but to me, and I guess this can lead into another question, I guess to me that the... the the storyline of those isn't quite the Phantom that I that I love. Yeah. The Fork Phantom. I mean, they they, they steer away from uh, various elements, um, but it sounds very much uh, Dan listening to you that you're very much more about the art of the Phantom or, or any of the comic books than the than the storylines. Would that be fair to say? Well, no. It's it's that 
when you collect the art, unless you're going to get the entire book, um, and actually I have complete stories, but it's, 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 you can't get them anymore, but it, back a long time ago, you could actually buy a complete story. Mm. But for my purposes, it's about the story as a whole, because right. when you're, when you're buying the artwork, all you're getting is one single page of the artist's work and you're not getting the story. Uh, you're just getting an exemplar of like one element of a very large, it'd be like getting a movie poster as opposed to getting a movie. Sure. You know what I mean? What you're doing is you're getting, and, and so you have to focus on the art when you collect original art because you, you most certainly are not focusing on the story. Now I have complete stories. And when you have the complete story, you can actually sit and you can see a lot of things, the development of the plot, you can see how the writer is moving it forward, you can see how it's being broken down, and I use the word shot by the artist, and you get a much yeah. more complete yeah. idea of what the art of comic books and the art of comic strips is about. However, for economical reasons, you can't get complete yeah. stories anymore. When I bought complete stories, which was a long time ago, nobody wanted the art in the first place. Yes. So it was it was easy to get the complete stories. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately economically what's happened is um, because the pages are, are worth so much money, most of the great stories have been broken up into pages. Yeah. And so yeah. as a collector all you can know. I, I focused on the artist because I wanted a representative um, example of the best that an artist would do mm. from the standpoint of buying a single page, knowing I couldn't get a complete story. Um, yeah. If in a perfect world, you, I'll give you an example. X Men One um, was a complete story for many years, and. Uh, it's a long story, but what happened was it was broken up um, and it was sold as individual pages. And that's true with most of the, Fanta the Fantastic Four. Jack Kirby got back, I believe, most of the fourth annual. And it had, I think he had the whole thing. And it was broken up and sold in, in, in pages. And it's, it's that way with virtually all of the Marvel yeah. art. I, I, I knew of various... Fantastic Four stories and Spider-Man stories, for instance, that were complete for very short periods of time. And I actually saw them in their complete mm -hmm. versions before the people that owned them broke them up and began selling them. Mm -hmm. Because when those stories were complete, which was back in the late 70s and 80s when they came out, um, you could buy a Ditko Spider-Man page for... Fifteen hundred dollars, which was quite a lot of money back then, in the in the mid eighties, early nineties. Mm. Now a Ditko Spider Man page sells for twenty, fifty, seventy five thousand dollars a page. A page, mm. which is which is why Fair that's quite cheap in comparison. Oh, that's like it's a whole different universe. I tried for years. One of one of the few things I don't have that I always wanted was I wanted a Steve Ditko pencils and inks Doctor Strange page. Good luck. <laughs> and I, I was trying to get one of those things back in the late 60s, early 70s, and I couldn't get one. I, I, the only ones I was ever offered were ones that were inked by Paul Reinman, whose inking style is very different from Steve Ditko's. But the point is, I never got one. So in answer to your question, we look for exemplars of the artists that are representative of the artist's talent, but we love the stories, but we can't collect the stories because it's a practical matter. You can't. I mean, I have, for instance, if you, you know who the man, Manhunter from Mars is? Martian Manhunter. Jo John Johns. It's a DC character. Uh, it was created by Joe Serta in 1954, I think, or 55 or something. 55. It was a backup story in Detective. And I have the last Manhunter from Mars story. I mean, the last one that was published before it was canceled in 1968 or something like that. And how did I get it? Well, my buddy Mitch Itkowitz got it from Joe Serta's widow. <laughs> and yeah. then he, 
for about five minutes before he told me he had it. <laughs> and then I bought it from him and it's been sitting in my collection for 30 some odd years or something. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so, all right. So, focus, before you jump in, Jim, just there on stories, um, uh, you, I, you, you were nodding. The podcast he, listeners won't have, <laughs> won't have seen that, but you were nodding when I mentioned that uh, the, the Charlton's and the, and the American stories sort of veered away from uh, the fork um, uh, storylines a little bit, which was why I wasn't as satisfied by them. So, I would take it by you know a number of the things that you've said tonight that. Uh, you would be someone who we would coin a forkist, and, and I'm one, um, who thinks that Lee Fork stories and, and Lee Fork chronology is the canon, if, if you like. Um, where do you stand on, you know, the last 20 years of uh, of the newspaper strip and other art, um, authors taking over and uh, versus the Egmont and the, and the American and other publishers' takes on the Phantom? What, what To you, Dan, what is the, the true Phantom, the official Phantom storyline? Well, first of all, um, the Lee Fock Phantom is like a person. And most people are not serious all the time. <laughs> and uh, the Phantom, the, the Lee Fock Phantom, which is the, the archetype for the Phantom, um, has a sense of humor and he has a personality. And you actually, if you read the Lee Fock Phantom, you know him as a person which is why he's so fantastic and you know his universe and it's a phenomenal universe and you know his history and you know the stories from the chronicles and you understand why he has a broken chain on his throne mm. and you understand all these things and of course people don't live forever so of course the strip should continue because it is one of the great comic strips ever created. And I, and I, I really believe that. So every generation will get a different iteration of the ghost who walks, which will be their iteration. Um, you know, as I grew up with Adam West as Batman, who I still love as Batman. And when Adam West died, I wrote a very, brief piece, which I, I do sometimes when I get upset when somebody dies. And I said, the, 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 my Batman, as with the Phantom, my Batman was the Cape Crusader. He was not the Dark Knight. Now, that, that doesn't mean the Dark Knight doesn't have his place in the Phantom canon. It doesn't mean it's not I mean, the Batman's canon. It doesn't mean he's not important. It doesn't mean it's just it's 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 an evolution of the character because as times change, the characters change. And so the current version is very relevant now because it is the current version. And if we bring in new fans, this is the version they're going to look at. Personally, um, the Lee Falk Phantom is my version of the Phantom because of my age and because I grew up reading that. And so for me, I can't escape the fact that that's the way I view the Phantom. It's the same with Batman. It's the same with the Green Lantern and the other characters that I love and that I grew up with. Um, with Batman, it's much more complicated because there have been a lot of iterations. But again, my version of Batman that I love is from the 60s and, interestingly, from the 40s and 50s. Well, no, it, it's not the goofy science fiction Batman from the 50s where they kind of lost their minds, you know, and it's got Martians and things like that. It's, it's the original version from the late 30s up through maybe uh, the early 50s, the Dick Sprang version. And then, and then when uh, Julie Schwartz took him over and come in, and it's the same with the Phantom. Um, and one of the things that, one of the big discussions that I had with King Features when we started to do the comic books was, I had looked at what had been done with the Phantom, um, the... Uh, the, the Phantom version that Dynamite had done, mm -hmm. which I was um, not satisfied with because I felt that that veered, that veered in a direction that was not in any way consistent with the ghost. Who, it was not the ghost who walks. Yeah. Too far. It was not, it, 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 it was not, the, it was not the man who can, it was the man, it was not the man who never dies. It, it, it was not the essence of the Phantom 
is that he does not exist, that he is a, uh, uh, a specter, that he is a myth, that he appears when you need him, but you really don't know whether he really exists or not. But we do know he lives forever. And that's a very romantic way of looking at the character, which is the way Lee Falk designed the character, and yet he's human, and he dies. And he takes his father, and he buries him, and he assumes the guise of the Phantom. And that's what makes the Phantom such a great character. Yeah. And when you, when you, and he has family, and he has a sense of humor. And when you, you veer away from that, and the example that I made when I, I, I made the pitch to, to do the comic book version yeah. was you don't take Superman and Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen and Perry White. You don't do that because that is part of his mythos. It's, it's part of what makes Superman Superman. And with the Phantom, you can do certain things with him um, and still have the Phantom. You know, I, I, I agree with you that the comic book iterations um, have never been as satisfying as the strip iterations. I, I really do love the, uh, uh, the Don Newton version, but it's a very different version. When he, he tells the origin in issue 67, it's great retelling because it takes place during the Second World War. And, and to me, it's got all the emotion um, that you need, and it's a very uh, satisfying um, story. But yes. it, 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 it does. I mean, it really does. I mean, you know, when Garan says to the Phantom, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, uh, you know I, I'm sorry that we doubted you, you know, because, you know, there's that moment of doubt because, you know, maybe he is human. And, uh, and then he says, oh, that's okay, Garan. He says, no. And then Garan says, you know, we have to go after the Germans. And, and he says, no, we don't need to because the, something like the swamp will punish them. Mm. You know, yeah. and then the Nazis go in, you know, and the alligators get him and you hear him screaming. And that's the Phantom because the Phantom does not kill unless it's absolutely. I tried to explain that to some people that the Phantom doesn't go in killing everybody. The Phantom yeah. is not the Punisher. That's yeah, not yes. mythos of the Phantom. And what, what was done to the Phantom was he wasn't the Phantom. Yeah. They, they, they took the name the Phantom and they created a different character that was yeah. so divergent from the soul of the character that it was, it was no longer relevant for people that loved it. Now, the whole point of, of doing that is to try to attract a new audience. But at what cost? At what cost? Yeah. Yeah. Destroying... Cool. Destroying 400 years of, 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 of created myth, created canon, destroying something that was painstakingly, lovingly created, where you basically have a human being who's a, who's a comic strip character, just like Superman or Batman, and erasing it all like it never existed. No, what you need to do is you need to create the things that make the Phantom great, and yet try to update it so a new audience can like it and 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 therein lies the rub that's a that's a pretty difficult thing what, what i did was i went to peter david who wrote the phantom in 1988 who was criticized by lee fuck because he was shooting people yeah. um and and i said to peter david who buys our books um you know i know that there was a story that you wanted to do that you didn't get to do and he said yeah and that was the story that we did in the in the first six books that we did and then the second a group of books we did, which have the John F. Kennedy storyline in them, um, which I think is a pretty, which incidentally, that book is done. We had some production issues, and it's coming out as a graphic novel with the complete story. And it's being solicited in, in previews, um, I think, next month or something like that. And we brought in another artist, Sinclair Klugersh, to assist the current artist who was unable to keep up with the schedule. Oh, uh, okay. He was he was overwhelmed. He uh, thought he could do it, and made a very valiant effort to do it, but was just not physically capable of handling the story in so, terms of turning. So, the so is the new artist coming as an assistant, or does do they take over the the strip? He took over. He took okay. over. But but he took over in a manner so that you will not know because we're using the same anchor. 
Oh, uh, okay. yeah. 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 And, and we're using the same colorist. And yeah. Sinclair, Sinclair is a very good artist who's, who's been inking for DC and other companies for many years and really wanted a shot as a penciler who's got all the talent and the ability to do it. And I've known him for quite a long time. Mm. And I said to him, unfortunately, you're going to have to make this look like the other artist instead of using your own style, which doesn't take away from Sinclair and does not take away from Sean Joyce. And I had said to Sean Joyce, I'm getting somebody to help you finish it. And uh, he wasn't particularly happy about that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I said, look, it, it took you, um, uh, he did uh, 14 pages in eight months. Oh, wow. And, right. and, okay. and, and it created some and it created some real problems uh, because I'm, I'm getting people screaming at me from my distributor yes. Going on, and I want him to finish it because he created the look that we had agreed on. But it's yes. finished, and um, it's going. And we have a really good anchor, uh, Molina, uh, Molina Molina, who uh, yeah, okay. she's a woman, and she's a really good anchor, and she's inking everybody's pencils. So it's going to be pretty difficult to tell yeah. that it's a different artist because we have the same anchor doing yeah. everything. And then okay, the so same. I just want to just just to clarify, just so everyone understands what's going on. So, we've got the first issue that's come out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Okay. Yes. And then the next issue, which will be out in the previews next month, you, you say, is going to be the trade paperback, which is going to be issues one, two, and three. Correct. Is that correct? That's yeah. absolutely. Correct. Absolutely. And correct. how? And when? And without having, without putting you on the spot and putting the pressure on you, and and setting yourself up for a fall and all that, when is that likely to be in comic book shops? October and November. October, November. Okay, cool. Okay, and, and, sweet. And, and and the only thing that's going that's going to be predicated on a number of issues which I don't have any control over, which has nothing to do with the art. Yeah. Uh, Currently having some political problems here in the United States. I, uh, I had not noticed. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, neither neither has anybody else, and, and, oh. and just I didn't vote for it. Uh, but, 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 uh, and, 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 I, and someone had to. Yeah, and everybody, everybody, everybody who knows me knows I didn't vote for him. But the oh, problem know. is that all art books are printed in Shenzhen, China, by a very, very, very fine printer. Um, one of the best printers in the world, and if uh, we get a <laughs> a twenty five percent tariff across the board on books, oh. yeah, right, there's no there's no tariff being imposed on printed matter. Um, yeah. We're going to have to shift and probably print a book in Hong Kong, right. and at, at this, my my printer has two printing plants. They have one in Hong Kong, which is where they have their, their pre-press facility and a small press printing uh, plant. Then they have their large press. The, the big fan book, you can't print that at a small press. It has to be, yeah. it has to be printed at, at a really big factory. Now, so I, correct me if I'm factory. wrong, but Hong Kong's still China, right? No, no. not for the purposes. <laughs> from what I understand, and I, and I could be wrong, <laughs> we're talking about this. We've been talking about this. Because it, we're all cringing at the fact that our, our costs could go up 20. Yes. Yeah. Which then so, yeah. gets brought to us and the consumer. Yeah. And... When, it, when, it, when it bites you, you know, you know it's, it's the old joke about, you know, it's a recession when your neighbor's out of work and it's a depression when you're out of you're work. You're out of work, yeah. Right. And, and the, 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 the tariff thing is abstract mm. till you go out of business. Um, yeah. And I know the next question is, why can't you print a book like that in the United States? And the answer is, you can print the book, but getting it bound correctly is another issue. And if anybody wants to take uh, uh, issue with me about that in the United States, I'd be more than glad to have a 40-hour conversation. <laughs> we'll we'll one, save that for another podcast. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to get into that. I, could print <laughs> it in, I can print it in Canada, but because I print a lot of stuff in Canada, the Avon novels. The Phantom Avon novels are printed at a very fine printer in, in uh, Ottawa, in uh, Montreal, uh, Marquis. But they don't print books like, you know, Heart, 
Yeah, they can't press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. That's the only thing that could could you know create a problem for us. But we're on schedule. The, the, the stories are done. They're being inked right now, and they're going to the colors. The colors is really <laughs> there's no issue about that. We do all the dialoguing at Hermes Press. Um, okay. uh, Alyssa Fisher does it. She's very good. She's one of our graphic designers. Oh, Alyssa Fisher is the one who does most of the Phantom Daily reconstructions, and uh, she is okay. super good. Just a just a real quick one. Um, you've mentioned lots of different names about roles in Hermes Press. How many how many employees are in Hermes Press? Because I think sometimes we've thought it was just the two of you guys, but it's clearly a much bigger <laughs> organisation oh, than that. that. I can't well, that. I wish it was small. No, We're because the loudest ones. Yeah, we have we people out of books. I mean, yeah, it's funny. Thing. Yeah, people that like Johnny Hazard think we only do Johnny Hazard. People that. That, that the like mm -hmm. Garfield, we only do Garfield. Um, we do uh, you know twenty books a year, um, but we have uh, Sabrina is the managing editor, and she does a lot of things administratively. She has I her own. She has. She she does the Avon the Avon uh, the, the Avon reprints. Uh, that's her uh, that's her projects. Right. She has a lot of different books that that are her projects. Um, then we have uh, Troy Musquire, who's my production manager, who uh, supervises production generally and does most of the color reconstructions. Um, he does most of the uh, Phantom Sunday's reconstructions. He does most of our comic book reconstructions, which range from uh, a book called Nukem, uh, great. Yep. Uh, uh, world yeah, yeah, basically it's the end of the world comic books from the 50s. Early fifties, where the, where the 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 Russians nuke the Americans, and we nuke them back, and it's very kitschy stuff and very um, relevant right now with the current political situation. And so he's doing the reconstructions on that. We just did a book on uh, DC Comics before Superman, which had all these stories that were done by the original uh, owner of uh, DC Comics, Malcolm Willow Nicholson. Troy did all the reconstructions, and that's you have Troy Musquire. Then you have Alyssa Fisher, who's our senior graphic designer. Who designs her own has her own projects, and and also does the Phantom Black and White reconstructions and Johnny Hazard Black and White reconstructions, and she has this group of stuff she works on, and she's really good. And then we have uh, a partner who works for us uh, on a part-time basis, who's our archivist, who was responsible for where everything goes and does scanning and does digital reprints too. She does. Uh, she's brought in on various projects when we like. Worked we did on Sky Skype. Masters. Yeah, we did Sky Masters of the Space Force, which is the Jack Kirby science fiction strip, and we had four people working on that once, including oh, wow. five actually, because I was working on it too. Um, and I was that was my project, so I was the one making everybody redo everything. Um, and then we have Brian Peck, who's a special projects editor who has his own group of books, and he works for Apple, but he works for us on the side. Um, and he did, yeah, yeah he, has his whole, he has a whole group of books that he does. Um, and then, uh, do we have anybody else? I think that's, well, oh, we have most importantly, we have Moose the Office Dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Moose got the Office Dog, that's true. Yes. Yeah, so, how many, how many people is that? I, I, I must admit, I, I lost count. Is that about <laughs> yeah, 10, 15? And, 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 and I'm going to get in a lot of trouble if I don't mention Fran Ackerman, oh, yes. who was responsible for shipping and receiving uh, and getting in the big shipments from China and then uh, inventorying everything and breaking it down and then reshipping it to, to, to Diamond uh, and, you know, our distributor, our book, mm. and book distributor. So that would be me, Sabrina, Candace, Troy, Alyssa. We can't count. Yeah, it's about seven, it's about seven people. Okay. Okay. Cool. And now, my mom does the taxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I want to um I want to go back to the comic book series. So, um, sure. well, actually, uh, yeah, no, we'll go we'll go there. Um, okay. So we touched upon the President Kennedy story. So the the trade paperback comic will be out in October, November. Right. Now. You've, you've with your dailies and Sundays and and even the Avons, you've hardly missed a beat, 
and it's you know and to the average consumer like i am it's been a roaring success i love the books you know love everything about it but the coin book series it's like you've crossed a, a black cat or something like that <laughs> with them um yeah. so would you do it again and have you been has it been a success or is there going to be a third one or is this going to be the end of it um and then also could you go into some of the you've gone into detail with the delays on series two could you go into a little bit of the uh detail as much as you can of with the delays with series one as well okay well yeah let's talk about the, yeah comic books that's an interesting question see the the, the thing about most of the books that we do, the a reprints, reprints. Yeah. Are, are reprints. And the thing is, is that they have a group of people that want them. Yeah. And the, the and I'll give you an example, and, and, and you guys have been very helpful. When we started doing the Avon, when I went to King Features and said, I want to reprint the Avon pocketbooks, they looked at me and said, why? Oh, really? <laughs> why, why would anybody want to do that? And I said, well, they're, they're great stories, and I love oh, them. Oh, they're amazing. And they said, you know, why? Why, why do you want to do this? <laughs> I answered that question. And I had somebody at King Features who understood me and understood the mission of Learning Express generally and supported us. And we had a real uphill battle and getting a license and finally we got the license and the comment from somebody was you're gonna you're gonna die on this one nobody's gonna buy this stuff and i said i don't think so because i like it and i know a lot of phantom fans and give me an international license and i'll sell the stuff all over the world i have to yeah. have an international license stuff. yeah and i'm gonna get to that because that's that's one of the, the issues with the comic yep. Yep. And, and okay. they said, they said, you want an international license for the Avon Phantom? Fine. You know, you can have it. Um, mm. So we printed the first one. It did really, really well. And then the sales numbers dropped off precipitously. And I did one of my YouTube videos and said something yeah. to the effect of, if you really like this stuff, then you have to buy it. Because if you don't buy it, I can't print it. And then you guys picked up on that. And then the numbers went back up. And we've had meetings with uh, Diamond, and uh, one of the guys that runs the book division said, "Why don't you just bring it out on us in an omnibus?" And I said, "Because it's no so fun." This big. Yeah, 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 fifteen books. <laughs> That's no the, the Gunda. You got to have all the covers, and you know, and and, yeah. uh, and then I said, "If you look at sales numbers, they're all real consistent, volume from volume, because the fan audience likes the books and they understand that we support the project." Okay. And no, we, also, we also want to get the whole collection. We're not just buying this story and that yeah. story. We want to get 1 right. through 15 sort of thing. And and when we're done, there's going to be a humongous slipcase. Slip yeah, big. Phantom art <laughs> all over it. So you can stick it in your bookcase and say, yeah, they all look really good together. But uh, so with yeah. the comic books, the way the licensing is split up all over the world. And uh, the Phantom is not... By contemporary, by the contemporary audience, Phantom is not a beloved character in the United States yes. for contemporary readers. And I knew that when I got the license. And I was also running up against the problem that the Phantom that was done previous to ours was not well received. Yeah, and the I'm Diamond one. Right. No, I, when Dynamite, I, sorry. Dynamite. Right, right. But, but I'm talking about, and then the second one they did where, where Lothar becomes the Phantom oh. was equally, equally, equally not well received either. No. Uh, and and that's that, panned on, panned on this one. Yeah. On, well, on it, our podcast. The, 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 the problem is if, if, if you're going to stick a finger in somebody's eye, you know, don't stick two fingers. That's bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the point is, is that that did not help the, 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 the audience in the United States. And so when we solicited the first, uh, the Peter David Phantom for Sal Bluto was doing it, we did a lot of publicity to, uh, to, to push those books. And I think that they're as good or better than anything Marvel and DC does. And, and the quality level of the writing and the art and the, everything. And, yeah. and the reaction yeah, that we that's got- fair. That's fair. We could, first of all, we're not allowed to sell those books outside of North America. Yes. 
We which... did a whole we did a whole podcast on on that, and uh, we was speaking to people like Renee and stuff like that who did them through Phantom's Vault and stuff. That's where I got my copies from. Was Phantom's Vault. Well, when we did a, a lot of, of, of publicity in the Phantom community in the United States and all over the world to sell the, the first mm. group of books, and uh, the people at Diamond, the people that run Diamond Comics, had seen the books because we had because we we, we, had, we were on we were on schedule till the end. We didn't realize that Sal was sick, and, yeah. which and Sal is is, is better now, but yes. you know, but, but the point is. Um, the people at Diamond saw the first couple of issues and they were screaming, God, this is great. You know, you're going to really do well on it. And, and we didn't. We, yeah. had, we had a sale of around seven or 8,000 copies of issue one with four variants in the United States. And uh, I was uh, really shocked because we had put everything but the kitchen sink into that, that group of comic books. And I thought I was being true to the character and, and doing good Phantom stories. And, and we labored on with it. And we mm. tried to crack the American market with the understanding that we can only sell in the United States and North America. And when we did the John Kennedy version, which I thought, again, was a really good idea because you have astronauts and Germans, Russian spies, and you have the Phantom. And you have him in, in the United States, and you have him, you know, hunting down these astronauts, and it's a good, it's a really, good, and I had Ron Goulart write the story, who actually ghost wrote most of the Avon mm. Phantom, yeah, yeah. Who, yeah. right? Who understands the Phantom? Because I'm very adamant about you don't understand him, you don't write him. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and I think and, that was the problem with the Charlton stories is that they almost wrote about a Tarzan instead of the Phantom. No, that, that, that's exactly right, and, 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 and I'm not speaking out of school to say we, we auditioned some guys to do the second Phantom thing, and we got samples, and I'm getting into arguments with these guys about, I mm. sent you the Bible, you need yeah. to with your canon. Well, you know, I, I don't, you know, one guy said, I don't understand why the Phantom has to wear glasses when he's in his, yeah. his, yeah. his and, I, yeah. and I said, and I remember saying to this guy, and looking him in the eye and saying, and the guy had no sense of humor. We didn't use him. I looked him in the eye and I said, old jungle saying, any man <laughs> who sees the eyes of the phantom does not have long to live. Yes. And he, and, he, and he looks at me and he says, and? And I said, <laughs> the old jungle saying? And he said, well, what, what's the old jungle saying uh, got to do? And I said, you say, thank you for trying. Goodbye. <laughs> I, said, I said, you don't look the phantom and you do not see the phantom's eyes. That's part of the myth. You don't see his eyes. His, you know, Diana can see his eyes. His children can see his eyes. Garan. You're not allowed to see the phantom's eyes. It's part of the myth. Okay. Yes. Kryptonite makes super. <laughs> okay. Are we getting it here? No, we're not getting it. No, I think we should be able to see his eyes. Well, you know what? I'm really not interested in what you think. I'm interested in a lot of things that you think creatively, but you don't change the character yeah, in that. Stuff like that. Okay. Yep. So we had worse numbers on the, the, the John Kennedy version. Oh. The, I, it, I was flabbergasted. I got an order for 3,500 books. Huh. And again, I was told by the people at Diamond, it's not the quality of what you're doing. It's the audience has been severely impacted by the stuff that was done by the other company because it's it's not been well received yeah and no, it wasn't i'm not giving up though because i'm really stupid um i'm not giving up and i can't say anything right now about a new series because we have to wait and we're, we're negotiating but i'll have some news for you maybe in a month on that uh, uh, but yep. the point right, is that what... i'm not i'm not giving up and yeah. I'm not, I'm not killing off the the 21st fan. <laughs> he's, he's like the, uh, the the coyote, you know. What I mean? Right, I'm not killing off the 21st fan. Um, you know, because it was suggested. Why don't you just, you know, make a new? One. And I said, and you've already heard me say this before. I said, well, I have a suggestion for you. Go over to DC Comics and yeah. tell them to kill Bruce Wayne and Batman. Okay. This is, yeah. You can kill Rock. Uh, yeah. 
kill off Bruce yeah. Wayne and Batman and then get a new guy to be Batman, okay? With a new... Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, it just doesn't you know? work. Well, right. even, yeah. Egg, Egmont have uh, floated the idea of... Um, and, and they've all, they've written a what-if type story. Um, yeah, that's... For, for the 22nd fan. You've seen that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, we've been doing those for years. What ifs are fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. So i got, I got a couple more. And sorry if these sound like hard questions, but these are some That's of the questions okay. that we've been uh, asked. I've been by. giving you pretty, I've been giving you pretty candid. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's good. Oh, it's I, excellent. I, yeah. I appreciate it. I appreciate your honesty and your, and, and your forthrightness and stuff like that. So how... How much of an issue is it the fact that these comics uh, cannot be distributed in a in a place like Australia? Because I would assume, or even India, I would assume that Australia would probably be uh, a huge part of the market that would eat all these stories up. Well, uh, you know, I I know. Uh, Renee White very well, and, and um, he's doing a really good job at yeah. And and he and I both know that you know we don't own the Phantom. Uh, you know yeah. we only have temporary. We only, we only have te- He's only in our 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 our, 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 our care and custody for a short period of time. Yes. He, yes. Uh, the answer is if. We have to build the we have to build the American market. Is really what we have to do on the Phantom. Yeah. So, because we we've been we've been we were approached by a couple of companies to take the stuff we were doing, the original stuff, and reprint it in different markets. And is that the comic book series or yeah, the, the comic, um, the the comic reprints? Okay. Well, there's an Italian company that is reprinting the Sundays, and they have a yes. license. Yeah, I don't know. I forget what their name is. Dolman? They, um, no, I don't know. No, that's the that. Spanish one. Oh, okay. No, yeah, no, this is this is an Italian company, and uh, they got a license from King Futures, and they approached us and said, can we uh, uh, buy your digital files? And I said, of course. And we made a deal with them, and we sold them uh, volume digital files. Yeah. Uh, for the, so I think they're doing it. Um, yeah. They've got but, gold gilding on the front cover, I think, from memory. They've never sent me the books, even though they. Yeah. Oh, okay. I haven't. Got, I've only seen it on eBay. Um, I've got two children now, so my uh, my <laughs> yeah, no. uh, my spending money has been severely cut. Instead no, of on Phantom stuff, it's now on nappies. Well, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I know exactly where you're coming from. <laughs> but, but, I mean, what I have to do is I have to, um, if we're going to continue with the Phantom comic books, we have to somehow grab mm. the American audience um, and the Canadian audience. Uh, however, I've been exploring trying to sell uh, the Phantom comic books um, in South America because there's a really big audience for that. Yes. That's licenses for that. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and that might be able to open it up. But the, the problem is because of the geographic limitations, of the license, um, it makes it difficult because, as you point out, Egmont controls its geographical area, and Fruit controls its geographic. And, and let's face it, the biggest fan base for the Phantom is oh, in Scan- Scandinavia and Australia and New Zealand, and not in the United States. Yes. Uh, but I still think that I can create good Phantom stories, and we're trying to figure that out with King Features right now, what we want to do. We are never going to stop doing the uh, the reprints of the original strips because we have the rights to reprint them until uh, Lee Falk passed away. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I was, I was going to ask about that. So, so That's that... where you're going to be stopping, is at the death? Not necessarily. Um Oh, good, because I would love to see some uh, Graham Nolan out there. I, I, uh, I, 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 I will say this without any fear of contradiction. King Features is very pleased with um, the quality of our fan. Oh, they'd have to. And, hmm. and actually, I mean, there's some people that might complain about this or that or the other thing, which is human. But, but by and large, yeah. 
but 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 by and by and by and large, and I think you would agree. And if you don't, please say so. But by and large, most people in the fandom community and over the entire world um, think that we're doing a pretty good job oh, on yeah. our print series and on the comic book reprints that we did, and and on the Avon books. And yes. King Fisher's agrees, and I think that Hermes Press has done a lot to make the fandom in the format that we present books more available to a much broader audience than before because our mission is um, there are um, five or six or seven companies in the United States that, that do archival reprints and our, our reason for doing that is each one of us have a different point of view well we kind of don't it's just that we have our favorites we all have the same point of view I believe Dick Tracy is a very important strip. IDW just got the rights to do it before I did. Um, I think Manage Make the Magician is a very, very yeah. great strip. I would love to do it. Titan got the rights to do it before I did. Um, I got the rights to do The Phantom uh, before other companies did. So, But I got lucky because that was actually, that was the top of my list. That was like, mm. that was actually the top of my list. And I, I got lucky. I and I got that i take all yeah, well, credit she, she grew up watching fam 2040 <laughs> and every saturday so, we would watch so sabrina we'll, we'll give you a chance to have a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a, a, a bit of a chance we're only two hours in <laughs> um, so you're saying that it's all because of you that we got the fansom so can we hear about that story oh well okay so obviously i don't know if people know dan herman is my dad yeah. And, you know, it's a family biz. And, you know, I grew up watching. I, I love the Billy Zane version. Yeah. Okay. No. Is that just because that... you like Billy Zane? I mean, I met Billy Zane. He shook my hand. I haven't watched it since. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was like three or four years ago. Um, no, five or six years ago. Shit, it's been a while. And um, I don't know. We just always watched it. And I was super into it. And, I mean, I grew up doing all of all the stuff that we've been talking about is my childhood, including, well, and, and the Star Trek too, because I love Star Trek. And then we were doing all the reprints and my, and my dad was like, decided to do the reprints of the Phantom because, you know, he and I enjoyed watching the movie and the Phantom 2040 when I was growing up. So that's why I take credit for it because I made him probably rewatch the Phantom 2040 on VHS. <laughs> oh, oh, so many. I wish times. they would bring it all out. I wish they would bring it yeah, out. Yeah, whole, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, I would love in, to um, the whole series. In Australia, they release. Thing. In Australia, they release season one of 2040, but they never release season two. Well, I'm sure we and have I, it recorded on VHS somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we actually but, we actually taped it when it was on. And that's what Baudelaire mm -hmm. told. But uh, yeah. oh, Baudelaire. <laughs> that's an inside joke for people that like 2040. Um, but you know, the thing is, is that uh, yeah, she, you know, she loved it. And I mean, when she was learning to read, I was teaching her how to read, reading her <laughs> yeah, Fantastic Four and Doom Patrol and uh, and stuff that I loved when I was a kid. And I got uh, my first PlayStation because I read a whole bunch of my only PlayStation because I read a bunch of strips. If I yeah. could read them, I'd get that PlayStation. I learned how to read real fast. <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, very, very, in, in 2002, when we were preparing to do our Starhawks, Gil Kane and Ron Goulart's Starhawks, and I had a license to do it, Sabrina was helping scan all this stuff. Yeah. Because at that point, we only had two people working at Hermes. We had this right. very, old, very old Mac and my then high school boyfriend, you know, we held hands. He helped me. He helped scan. It. He's in the book. If you look at the original one, he'll probably yeah. see. It go. Oh God, really? Um, but yeah. Yeah, that was so sixteen years ago. So I mean, yeah, it's a family business, so and we started out that way. But now, you know, we do. You know, it's like right now. We I think we yeah we announced this already. We're doing a, a film noir Dick Tracy graphic novel yeah, for next year. We Right, and, and the guy that's doing it was a very close friend of Chester Gould's and was a Dale Messick's assistant on Brenda Storm. And uh, as a matter of fact, in the I, I won't give anything away, but in the script for the new Dick Tracy graphic novel, which is really, really film noir, which is really good, Brenda Starr interviews Dick Tracy um, in, the, in the thing, you know, uh, in the graphic novel. 
So uh, it's kind of interesting. But I mean, you know, we've we've progressed, you know, from one book to twenty to more than that. Mm. And, uh, and but the Phantom is just really one of my favorite strips. Yeah, uh, I can I can definitely we can definitely tell that. Like even with your, your videos and your and your like the started with the dailies and the Sundays and then you got the comic book series and then you've got the Avons and, and all these other types of stuff. You can definitely tell that it is one of your favourites. Now, we need to ask you about the art of the ghost who walks book. Yeah. Right. But before I ask you that, I want to slightly get back to where we were before and just ask you a couple of follow on questions regarding the comic book series. Now, <laughs> um, now when, so will they, Will they be available via Phantom's Vault again, um, and also uh, with the dailies and Sundays? Well, I've been getting them for, my for me. Book store. You, what your Avon? Uh, the Avon and the I got the um, the President Kennedy's uh, Volume One uh, yeah. through my comic book store through the through Diamond. Well, that yeah, cause, that yeah, that's that's one of those great mysteries of distribution, <laughs> which, which I don't have anything to do with. Um, yeah. Because like my comic book shop doesn't can't get all whether they don't have the same connections as Dan's or what, but they don't get any of that stuff anymore. So I've been getting it mainly through Renee's site, Fans Vault, um, and I don't even have a, a copy of the first uh, Kennedy series yet. Um, when we reviewed it, I had to get Dan to take photos of it yeah. so I could actually kind of like read it. So I haven't even read it in proper in paper print. form yet in print. So Will they be coming out via Phantom's Vault for those who don't have access via their comic book store? Yeah. All I can say is this. I get the stuff to my distributor, and then I hear all these stories about how companies buy stuff in the United States and ship it out. We don't do that because we only sell through our distributor. Although we do, you know, you can buy stuff on our website. Straight off right the website. Um, yeah. I want the website. But, I mean... I'm permitted to sell the stuff in the North American market, and I sell through Diamond Comic Distributors and Diamond Book Distributors. And I turn the stuff over to them. And um, if a comic book store in Australia has a U.S. account, and they buy the stuff in the United States, which is what I'm hearing, and then they ship it over, I have nothing to do with that. It doesn't involve yeah. me involves them and Diamond, and if they're reshipping the stuff, it doesn't create a problem because uh, I'm not in it. And so I don't really have any control over that. I mean, I know that, for instance, um, I have books that have international licenses, and they get to the craziest places, even though my distributor isn't selling them. Uh, for instance, I know that a lot of my stuff, I, you know, Jerry Anderson, Thunderbirds and Fireball XL5 and all that stuff. I did a whole bunch of books on, uh, I did Sylvia Anderson's autobiography art book back in 2007. And we, we could sell that book anywhere. And we were selling it in the UK. But it, it got, I don't know how it got picked up all over the world. And it was in Japan and it was everywhere. But our distributor wasn't selling it to a Japanese distributor. It was being picked up by a third party through our English distributor and uh, which is Diamond UK and being sold over to Japan. It was nothing just perfectly legal because I had an international license from Sylvia Anderson to do whatever I wanted with it. But once it gets out, I have no control over what third parties do. And I see my, I, I'll give you an, and, and, and sometimes it really irritates me because, for instance, with Sky Masters, which, which is out of print now, uh, the Jack Kirby Wally Wood strip. Um, it's out of print, and so now we see third-party vendors who bought them trying to sell them for 25 and 35 percent more mm. than the price. Uh, and I see it, for, yeah, and I see it for sale in England, and I see it for in I see it for sale in London, for instance, and I see it for sale in different markets where it's out of print. So they've acquired it from a third party, and they're marking it up. And we do not. Let me just say this. We do not remainder our Phantom books. We don't sell them in bulk to people for nothing so they can resell them. I don't believe in doing that with our Phantom yeah, books. Yeah. And the Phantom books are printed in, in, in print runs that mirror pretty much what the audience is going to buy. And then I, I increase it 
by maybe 20 or 25 or 30 percent based on what I think I'll need for back stock. So a lot of people are yelling, you know, why don't you have that in print? Well, the answer is because we can't afford to print 5,000 copies of a book that sells 1,000 or 1,200 copies yeah. and 2,800 copies. And sometimes in things run out and people have just got to either get in on the ground floor or pay more for, for resales. You, you, you can't. You know, have an unlimited supply for people. It's that's no, I mean, unrealistic. We, right, we can't we, we can't afford to do that, which is why I say to people, if you want one of our books, our dailies books or Sundays books, pr please pre-order it. Pre-order, yeah. Because it it it's first of all, let me just say, to print a book even in China, where my cost is is lower than it would be if I printed it here in North America, it's still extraordinarily expensive to print these books. Yeah. Uh, and and our profit margin is not super duper high because we have to pay a license to King Features, and yeah, we have we I mean you know we we got to pay everything you know yeah. and we got to pay it was an earnings for us but but the point yeah. is that you know even the larger reprint companies uh, are not printing huge humongous print runs of their of their reprint books. I mean I, I you know, I'm not going to say but I know the numbers that they're printing generally. And they're not inconsistent with what I'm printing uh, because because the audience is limited to people that love this stuff, and yeah. you can't take the Phantom Volume 13, which incidentally it's printed, and I and I have a copy right here. All those covers. So if you don't, oh, yeah, that cover. I'm sorry. This, cover. this no, is no. Phantom. This is this I love is that cover. Team. And this is this, this covers, is actually going to be here. Yeah, this is actually going to be here in a couple of weeks. It's in transit right now. It's somewhere in the Pacific. In the Pacific. No, it's somewhere in the Atlantic. It hasn't been hijacked by pirates like Volume. No, no, same pirates. <laughs> but it's cool. it's it's in transit. And let me just also say that Phantom 14 is done and going to the printer next week. Mm -hmm. And Phantom 15 is done, and we're waiting it's for an order because we've been we've been pumping these things out on a much mm -hmm. more regular mm -hmm. basis. And I'll tell you why, because I want to get to the Siberi Phantom because a lot of people have said, like, why don't you just skip to the Siberi Phantom? Well, you so, can't do that, <laughs> obviously, but yeah. Yeah. Do it that way. I'm no, sorry. That's good. We, don't, we don't do it that way. But uh, no, so, I mean, the comic book, uh, printing the comic books, it's always been a problem for every publisher that's had it because of the audience. Charlton had the longest run of the Phantom uh, because Charlton uh, did everything in house. Uh, uh, Charlton had a printing plant. They had they were one of the, the 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 worst printers in the United States because they bought a cereal printing factory that, that they printed cereal boxes on in Connecticut. And the guys that owned Charlton actually built the building by themselves, brick by brick. And uh, and they. Uh, had some of the worst printing in the industry because they did it all themselves instead of subcontracting it out to really good printers. And so they had very, and they, and they, they paid the lowest page rate in the industry mm. and they had a lot of guys on staff. So they, you know, they were, they were like at the bottom of the food chain when it came to quality. Uh, and so they were able to get a product out at a very, very low per unit cost. And so they were actually able to do very well on the Phantom and the other titles they were doing um, until they ultimately lost their licenses and went out of business. Um, so that's the reason they were able to, to continue so long. I don't, I don't live in that in that universe. Uh, I don't know my own printing plan. I don't, you know, they were in Connecticut. They were in rural Connecticut. But uh, you know, I I have to deal with market forces. I'm not particularly inclined to give up. On something that I really like, where I think I'm doing a good job, but King Features is going to have to make a decision on what they want to do as far as that's concerned. Um, we actually have a number of uh, plots worked out uh, for the Phantom, um, which are all pretty interesting. Um, there were books that were actually where the stories were done and everything, and then we ran into this problem where we were unable to get the art finished. On, on that, which slowed us down. And I wasn't going to go into production on three or four books at one time because yeah. that would have been financially not a yeah. good decision. Yeah, yeah. One, 
So I'm considering doing, and, and I want some reaction from fans out there, is instead of doing series, I was going to do one-shots, where you would have uh -huh. a 20-page book, you would have a, maybe a 26-page book story, but it would be a self-contained story, which might boost the circulation of the books, because you wouldn't have to buy five or six or three or four or whatever, yeah. and you would get a self-contained story and we've been able to deal with that financially better. And the thing is, is that you would get a different story. We'd be able to do maybe five of those a year. And you can have different creative teams and stuff like yeah. that. So you're not yeah. stuck. Well, fan and fans, if you are still listening and uh, you've just heard the question <laughs> from Dan, uh, we'll put it up on the podcast again. Yeah. I'm sure yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Hermes will probably promote it as well. But if you would prefer standalone comics, the one shots, uh, yeah. The one shots, let us or let Hermes know and we can go from there. Now, we don't want to, don't want to keep you for too long, but I ha we have to ask you now, you did make mention of this in the six mini interview that we did prior to this, which we thank you for that. And that uh, got a lot of traction with uh, our readers and a lot of people who were asking the question. So first of all, we would like to say thank you for that. But out of the Ghost Who Walks book, now you've talked to us actually pre podcast about this and we had to say you know we'll, we'll ask you during the podcast so could you tell us first of all a little bit about the book about the vision of the book um and then you know what i guess when's it coming out and um and, I, th you know, I, I think a lot yeah. of people are really looking forward to it and certainly mm. um you know i think people who who pre-ordered especially are starting to go well hang on you know please i want i want my book <laughs> yeah Okay, first, first of all, it's coming. The, the, the reason the book took so long was because I um, incorrectly assumed that I could get a lot of stuff that I wanted, and I incorrectly assumed that. As I said, I don't know if I said it on the, but uh, P. Kloss has a huge collection of um, Phantom stuff. And yes. my, my, uh, my production manager and my chief graphic designer. Uh, went down to his house, and uh, he lives near Baltimore, and uh, and they scanned and shot, photographed his everything in his collection, and we're sorting. I sorted through that stuff and picked out stuff that I wanted because he has a lot of specialty pieces. Yes, that were just done for him, and I wanted to focus on printed, uh, published stuff, and not so much on specialty pieces, but on really good specialty pieces. Okay. So I wanted to print. And, and by, sorry, and by established artists, or by is everybody. that your focus? Everybody, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, for for instance, there were there were Australian variant covers for uh, for the first Phantom series that we did. So every, every one of those covers is going to be in the book, oh. and those were not done by artists that are known outside of Australia and New Zealand. Oh. Uh, so to answer to your question. We're going to, and like for instance, Dick Giordano did stuff for uh, Egmont. Yes. And uh, and of course, Sal did, Sal Luda did. And there are a lot of artists uh, that, I think uh, Nolan, a lot of artists did stuff for Egmont that's very, very nice. And I, I wanted to put that in the book. The problem is mm. we're talking about stuff from all over the world. So I'm going to miss stuff. And, but I tried to get as much as I could. And one of the things that helped me up was I really wanted to do a complete Phantom story, the original art for a complete Phantom story. Mm -hmm. And it's just, that, that's just not going to happen. I have uh, most of the stuff from the, here, I'll show you. I have a lot of it here, actually. This is from the, uh, the, the Pharaoh Phantom. So I this like is, yeah, this is the second chapter splash. Hold it a little closer so they can. Which is in my collection. It's in the yeah. mind. I have scanned. Yeah. I have most of the. Uh, I have a lot of the art from this book. I don't have all of it, but I have. I think I don't own it, but I have scans of. Um, all the Pharaoh. Yeah. Yeah, I have maybe like eighty, maybe ninety percent of it. I think I'm missing like four pages, so I'm gonna run a lot of that. I'm gonna run selected pages, not all my stuff, but good pages. And then I wanted to run a, a Don Newton story. I wanted to do 67. And right now, I think I have like 16 or 17 pages. Thanks to you guys, I got 
three, three or four more. Um, and here's one of the pages that's the one page that I own. Um, and I'm just showing this so uh, fans can see that the book's going to be reality because we have a lot of material. This is the, uh, the one page I have. But I have, um, I think we have 16, 17 pages from this. So we're just going to run them yeah. all. And they're, they're yeah. not going to be, you know, it's not going to be the whole story, but that's life. You can't get everything you want. Yeah. So it's trying to get the material. I, I had a, first of all, I have a lot of material. I have thousands of images. And we're going to uh, edit them down so that it's, you know, a 240-page book or something like that. But you're going to get a really big sampling of the Ray Moore stuff more than you've probably ever seen the original. You probably, you've probably seen most of the stuff I'm going to do, though. Uh, Wilson McCoy stuff, uh, early, middle, and late Wilson McCoy stuff. Um, the stuff that we have from, um, I have some of the really early stuff that, this this piece here isn't even signed by Siberi, but he did it. And the the, the ring is really neat. Mm. Oh, so yeah, you have to move it mark from, from Macaw. Yeah. 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 Oh, so I, I, know, I know people who are going to be looking at this and just um, yeah, be very excited by what they're seeing. These pieces these pieces are going to be in the book, for instance. Yeah, but I have more of them, and it's it's not just you know it's obviously not my all my stuff. This is just the reason I brought this is because I knew we were doing this, and I thought it would be neat to see the original. Yeah, this is yeah. a very very early Siberian oh, epidemic. Story. Yeah, look and at this. The second or third daily story, I That's, think it is. Yeah, yeah, and, and look, it's it's a number. This is number fifty three, and yeah. look at this. Yeah. And I think the second story, and then there's another one. Uh, is that the reef? Yeah, and then, then yeah, and, and, and wait a minute, and, and get this. This is what I was talking about at Comic Con. That's where yeah. I got this stuff. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, th these are You've the pieces. You've been hanging that... on to it for this long and, and finally oh, getting it into a book. Black hole. Yeah, black and then wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> black hole. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then they had some really late Wilson McCoy stuff. And like I said, we were pulling out all the pieces that had the Phantom in every panel. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I have an opportunity. So when one is presented with an opportunity, right. one must grab at the moment, and mm -hmm. that's a that's a pretty good Wilson McCoy hit. Like, yeah. And yes. Then, and then here's an, here's another one. Now, for all those who are watching the video, please excuse please excuse the close-ups of uh, Dan's <laughs> and my Jermaine head. and I have just suddenly got very um, close to the cameras. <laughs> yeah, we're just put your hand up here. Okay, <laughs> and if you're listening think... to the podcast, tune into the YouTube because this is yeah. unreal. Yeah, this so, so yeah. this is so, the reason I'm showing you this is so, so that everybody understands that this is a real book that's coming out that has real material on it, and it's so great it's because Dan Herman. Uh, wanted to try to get more stuff than he was able to get and finally mm. said people are screaming at me i need to finish it it's it's out of my desire to create I'm screaming at him uh, yeah <laughs> really screaming at him. it was out of my desire to create a really nice book because i could have taken the material that i had and done the book and then i would have said you know i missed that person and i'm i'm, yeah. I'm never going to be satisfied because i'm never going to hit everybody yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get all the artists that I want. So if, if I miss somebody, I apologize. I'm trying the best I can. But the book's coming out because it has to come out. You know what I mean? You can't yeah. wait for it. But the, the, the concept of the book is to deal with the strip artists um, and to deal with the book, the artists that did the comic books and to have a lot of material, including all the uh, – all the, uh, the the George Wilson covers that were done, and when we did, and we have uh, scans of some of the paintings, the George Wilson paintings. We don't have all of them, but we have maybe eight or nine of them, or something like that. And I don't own any of the George Wilson paintings, yeah. but um, when yes. we did the, yeah, it's too bad because I really like them. But um, I had uh, when we did the uh, the, the Gold Key Volumes One and Two. One of the things which you may or may not notice is they're really clean looking. 
And the reason is because we either used the original painting and then we had a, an element for the logo where we had actually taken the logo off and recreated the original uh, Gold Key logos. We actually recreated them in a digital file and then dropped them over the original art. Yeah. So it was actually the cover is neater than the one on the original comic book because we're scanning off the original art instead of scanning the comic book cover. And we, we didn't do that with all of them because we didn't have all of them. But what, what we did do, and I, I did most of these myself, is I digitally repainted the logos off all of the artwork and then repainted it so it was like one piece of original art. And then since we had the, the title elements in, in separate files, they were uh, vectorized um, illustrator uh, graphics. So we had like, you know, the Phantom and blah, 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 and then the actual logo that they use on the, on the gold key. We actually did that with the, with the Charlton and the King ones too, is where we had all the logos uh, mm -hmm. were done by um, uh, Alyssa Fisher. And she took them and she redrew them. She, she drew over them in um, Illustrator and made them into vectorized files so they can be blown up to any size and they don't lose the grain or the resolution or anything. And then we dropped them back onto the art that had been done, which is why those covers look so pristine because they were, they were done over to look perfect as perfect mm -hmm. as, as you can get them. So we're going to actually put them all in the book. They're all going to wow. be in the Phantom. So you're going to get 73 covers. Um, oh, wow. Which, you know, I think they're really great covers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. not, not, um, the George ones are great. Yeah, we're going to have the Charlton ones, the King ones, which the King ones were based off images that Siberi did. Yes. As everybody knows. And, and, and we're going to have all the gold key ones. And we're going to have a really nice selection of the Avon covers because we've done, digitally redone those the same way. Of course. And we're going to have a lot of the comic art and we're going to have large portions of the Pharaoh Phantom story and the retelling of 67, the origin, uh, the Don Newton. And we're going to have the painted covers that people know about that Don Newton did together with that really famous Don Newton uh, piece that was done for Comic Blast, Comic Collector, um, you know, where he's sitting in the in the, the chair with with Devil. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll have that. I'll have and that we're going to have a lot of stuff from uh, artists that did stuff for uh, Egmont, and we're going to have the Australian artists, and uh, you know, so we're going to try to cover. The book tries to cover as much as it can, yeah. but I. As long as I have in what I just told you, I've given you a pretty good sampling, and yeah, yes. so that's, that's a lot of art. So it, that's it is. basically. Is, and, is uh, there any? Oh, sorry, Sabrina, go. I was just going to say regarding Don Newton, I was um, privileged to be able to interview his son Tony shortly before. Oh he passed wow! Away. And that's actually the interview is going to be in the Don Newton fam that's coming out. But we could probably put some excerpts of it into that because he had a lot of fun stories about his dad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the Don Newton Phantom is nicer than Phantom Volume Five because I was not entirely satisfied that the stories came out. The stories were a little dark, so and that was the printer, um, because our files didn't look that way, and so I had them adjusted so that in the Don Newton Phantom, the reproduction is going to be better than it was in the uh, Phantom Volume 5. But the, oh, Don wow. Newton, but the Don Newton Phantom focuses exclusively on the Don Newton stories, and it has a lot of original Don Newton right. art, including uh, stuff that he did for DC Comics, yeah. uh, and, and, and covers that he did for comic, uh, uh, comic Collector, Rocket Blast Comic Collector, and a bunch of specialty Phantom pieces that he did as well. So the, the Don Newton Phantom is different from uh, Charlton Five because it's got a lot of, and also has a much longer essay about Don Newton's life. And it also has the interview that, that Sabrina did with Don Newton's son. And we have a bunch of pictures that we got from yes. uh, Don Newton's uh, widow, you know, widow of, of him and his son. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's like, if you like the Phantom and you like Don Newton, uh, yeah, you know, it's the perfect you know, marriage it's there for you. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's the thing that I wanted to do for Don Newton, which was really what it yeah. was. Yeah. So yeah, does definitely. The, the, uh, the book, The Art of the Ghost of Walks, does that have 
you've just mentioned the you know potentially um, stories from from Tony Newton. Does it have a lot of prose in it, and and or is it all artwork? No, no, it has it has it has yeah, it has an essay which explains what the book is, and yeah. it discusses very briefly the artists, right. so that you you, you get a background for what context. It is. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah, it's just very, it's basically got a couple of it's got one long essay that's basically explains what the book is and who cool. the artists are, and then as it goes from chapter to chapter, it, it has like a page setting up each chapter saying cool. this is what it is. And, and, you know, the thing is, it makes a pretty good case that the art's pretty diverse. Yeah. And, 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 it, and it gives, you know, a, a broad range of the artists. And the project, when I envisioned it, you know, I wanted to do certain things, and I'm pretty close to what I wanted to do. I mean, you know, yeah. not be able to do what I wanted to do. But I mean, I have the same problem. I did a book on I did a book on Alex Raymond, who, who did Flash Gordon, and I was able to do the book that I wanted, but I wasn't able to get everything that I wanted. And I have maybe six or seven hundred Alex Raymond images in that book, and um, it's 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 a pretty nice book, and everybody likes it. And uh, you know, the problem is I bit off more than I could chew. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but you know, it's coming out, and I think everyone will like it. And the reason I brought the art along is so people will see. Well, that's going to be in there, folks. Yeah, yeah. And it's pretty big. So, so, so just so it's going to be. I think you said two twenty, two forty pages. Two forty, I think. Yeah, about two forty. It may actually be bigger, but you know, right and now. Do we have? Uh, is it hardcover? Yeah, only oh, hardcover. Oh, yeah. you do. <laughs> now, uh, what's the price in the US or, or whatever? Just so that way people, I'm just. I don't think well, I'm, I, I'm now sold. I'm about to go on your website and do a pre order. I hope it's not too late. <laughs> uh, Sabrina has. Yeah. I don't remember. The, what's I the price? Six, I think it's $65. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, yep. So it's about, a very expensive book to print. It's, it's a nice book. Whatever it says on the website is what it is. So yeah. about yeah, it's on sale for 60 and we're having a sale right now. Yeah, we are actually. So website. speaking speaking of sales, I'll, I'll, I'll assume on, you are hang too. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me finish these questions. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so it's so you said it was sixty US. So let's quickly do a uh, a conversion. It's sixty five retail. We just have it for less on the website. Okay, so sixty five US for Australian is is about ninety bucks. That's sixty five. So just so people are aware of that. Now, when is it likely to be available for people to be viewing? It'll probably, let me see. This is, uh, wait a minute, we're, we're so in August. What, August? Yeah, we're August, September. So it goes to the printer. Remember. It'll be available either in late December or early January, depending on the political. I think the January side. <laughs> yeah. As long as we beat the Chinese New Year, we'll be fine. Yeah, Chinese well, it, <laughs> yeah. Well, Chinese New Year, we always have to consider that Chinese yeah, New Year. Yeah, because nothing happens. Oh, they shut down. Or it gets um, hijacked by pirates again, which. Well, actually, actually, you know, this is a fun story, and everybody knows this, but one of the largest shipping lines in the world, which was Korean, um, went bankrupt. And they were in, uh, and and they were going to seize all their cargo. And we had a, a fan on one of their, uh, you know, it was in a container on one of their ships, and yeah. uh, and we were getting a lot of flack about where's your book, where's your book. And I said, well, you know, actually, we know the tanker, we we know the ship that it's on. on that. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, right online watching it, you know, sitting outside the Suez Canal because they don't want to seize the boat. And it was sitting there for two months. Uh, so the wow. pirates would have been better off seizing it because we probably could have gotten, I could have bought it back from them, you know, and gotten a better price. <laughs> but, 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 but ultimately, they got a loan and they were able to get the stuff to port and were able to get it. So, I mean, sometimes, and that happened to everybody. It happened to everybody <laughs> in the comic book business. It's time for Christmas. Yeah, but this book is going and I don't, and, you know, if, 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 listen, I'm going to print it, if it, they stick a tariff on it, we'll still just print it. Live with it and it'll come in and that'll be it. And we'll figure out what we're doing and that's life. 
Um, I'm not going to start printing my books um, someplace else. I'll print them in Hong Kong or China. We may have to print them in Korea, Singapore. I don't know, but we're gonna have to wait to see, you know, how that how that turns out. Yep. So, so the question yep. I was gonna ask there is about the sales that you do, and and I think as far as publishing houses, uh, fan and publishing houses go, you guys are as good as anyone at the social media stuff and the and the publicising your own stuff. And I'm on the mailing Probably list. Better. Get... Thank you. Sorry? That's also awesome. better. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. yeah. So I'm on the mailing list. I get the emails, the Twitter alerts, the, the you're on Facebook, the YouTube videos, which you mentioned right from the very start, which which I really like, and and um, we get that insight about uh, you know we need to pick up sales of the Avons and and whatever. So um, how important to you is the, or is all that social media side of things? Oh, it's so uh, important. It's, it's so important. It's, it's I do all the Media. So if you see anything that looks like kitschy, that's that's probably me. But it's, it's, yeah, we're, I'm constantly doing press releases and yep. Twitter. Yeah. And I don't do Tumblr anymore because that 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 was yeah, just painful. Is, but, that, is uh, that still around? Yes, <laughs> it's owned by Yahoo now. Oh, oh, well, that's probably why it's why it's painful. Yeah. No, I I think I think <laughs> that that in no, I think in the comic book world. It's absolutely essential, mm -hmm. and with a phantom, I think it's even more absolutely essential because I can tell you that at Comic Con, I meet same phantom fans every year. I know people that buy this stuff. Um, one of the reasons I got to know Peter David was because he would come up to my booth and buy phantom books and say, "I really love the phantom," and which I didn't know. And he would uh -huh. come up at Comic Con and say, "I really love the phantom," and I get to know people because. I'm at my own booth at Comic Con. I do run around and make deals to do things, but I do talk to everybody yeah. that I can when I'm there because you know I'm very shy and I don't talk to people. I'm very social. Awesome. <laughs> 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 but you no, know, I think that that having an ability to do, to talk directly to the people that are are buying your stuff is absolutely vital mm -hmm. because you want to create a product that you like uh, that you think is important which I, I think the stuff we do is historically important and I think it's good entertainment and I need, and I listen to feedback. I mean, I actually yeah, listen. Yeah. I, don't, I don't necessarily always agree with it. I don't necessarily always implement it, but I do sometimes and I do listen to criticism and I take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll give you an example. I listen very carefully to Ivan Patterson and I have a lot of respect for him. And, uh, and, you know, if, if you ignore uh, people that have good intentions that want to help you do something, then you are indeed foolish. And I try to listen to everybody because all they want to do is make the stuff I'm doing better. So why would yeah. I not listen to them? And the yeah. way I do that is through this social media. Yeah. That's how we a, do good, it. a good example of that is for the Avon novels. I forget which one. Maybe it was five or six. Uh, the original did not have a chapter 10. It went chapter 9, chapter 11. Yeah. The continuity was there. Nothing was changed. They just had misnumbered it originally. Okay. And I'm pretty active on one of the Phantom Facebook groups. And I, I reached out and I said, hey, guys, quick question. We're doing reprints. Would it be better if I were to change it and change the numbering and put a note and say chapter 10, 11, 12? Or would you prefer... As fans, I think we did a, a, a poll actually. Yeah, I remember keep this. It, keep it, go 9 11. And I think uh, we ended up keeping 9 11. I put an asterisk, and yeah. in the beginning, I put an editor's note saying, We're not missing a chapter. This is it, how it was originally. Yeah. yeah. So we use them yeah. all the time. And some of our covers, people don't like particular elements. If people reach out and say, We really hate this cover, we actually ended up changing the cover for, for daily 15. Is it 15? Or right. 16. From yeah, I remember. Yeah. attacked by a bunch of natives, which everyone was like, well, that's a little. It's not, yeah. it's not 2018. It look... Yeah, exactly. It's not exactly. really appropriate. So we changed it because people reached out on the Facebook group and on the Twitter and said, yo, dogs, don't do that. That's not cool. Yeah. yeah. They didn't actually say it like that. No. But... And you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you know what's interesting is that the cover that replaced it is a lot neater than 
because it's 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 the Phantom on uh, on 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 Hero, uh, Which and we it's do a lot, but we like Hero, we like Devil, we sure. like random yeah. women. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's it's a I much. Covers, so. <laughs> I'm very proud so of no, I mean, I mean, the thing is, is that, like I said, you know, you know, it's an old jungle saying, you know, first. <laughs> I uh, I do quote old, old jungle sayings quite frequently, usually with my artists who aren't listening to me. Uh, <laughs> and I always get this look. And I and 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 well, when I talked to Peter David and he was doing the band, he was actually quoting old jungle yeah. sayings. To me. So I knew that we were in sync and yep. things were going very well. That was the true pleasure working with him, uh, because he loved it as much as I did. And um, and that's always fun when you're doing something with somebody that's just uh, synced in with you. Yeah, it yeah. makes it a lot easier. Cool. All right. Um, I think we'll start to wrap up, but I've got a couple of questions that I've been asking some uh, fellow fans and stuff like that as well. So uh, we put out a wide net to basically some of our friends, some of our Patreon supporters and stuff like that. So I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, and then, and then we'll begin to wrap up. So first one was from, uh, a, a guy over in Sweden. Uh, I was wondering whether you have any interest in publishing Swedish stories in English for the U S audience. Absolutely. Okay, that's, that's, cool. I've, ta I've talked to Renee White about, about that because he, uh, told me that he was doing it and I should, I would not have any problems getting material from Egmont and yep. um, what I wanted to do and I haven't talked to King Features about this yet and it's not a problem I telling you about it was to get do like I did the hardcovers to actually yeah. print in bound volumes hardcover bound volumes and do like maybe 10 or 12 stories or something like that in one big, big book and do a series of them and that's on my list of things that I need to talk to King Features about uh, because the answer is yes, I want to do that. And we have somebody who can translate them because one of our relatives is a translator and lives in Sweden. Oh, um, okay. So she's a professional translator and she's a relative. Well, that always helps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Also. Uh, in Australia, now, we call that mates' rights. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, another question. Now, we quickly, we quickly touched upon this regarding. Uh, the newspaper strips with uh, the Cy Barry era. Now, I don't want to sound insensitive, and I hope I'm not, because um, unfortunately he's not probably not going to be with us too much longer. Is there a um, is there a thought or, or something that you want to like to try and get the books out while while he's still around and stuff like that, so we can well, yes. showcase his his work yeah. and. Because well, he's no, a very I, underrated artist. Well, first of all, I agree with you. I, I had a very unfortunate thing uh, occur to me many years ago when I published my first book, which I wrote a biography of Gil Kane. And Gil Kane was one of my mentors. And um, I spent maybe almost a year talking to him. I talked to him for four or five months every weekend. And he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the, I was preparing the book and he passed away and he never got oh. to see it. And I called up his wife and I said, what do you want me to do? And she said, quote, get off your ass and do the book. <laughs> yeah. I, did, I did get off my ass and, 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 and I was talking to uh, Gary Groth, who uh, is the publisher at Fanographics, who was also very extremely close to Gil. And he looked at me and said, God, Gil's been gone. You know, it's been 18 years. And I said, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Time passes really quickly. So in answer to your question, yes, I want to try to get these books out so Cy can see them and so Cy can be proud of his work yes. being published in an archival yes. edition yes. and taken very, very seriously as it should be because it's phenomenal stuff. Yeah. And um, we're going to try to get him. We're going to try to do a special limited edition. I talked to him very briefly about it maybe about six or seven months ago, and, and I haven't followed up on it, and I probably should. What we wanted to do is take like one of these images that we have, one of these strip images, which is very classic, and isolate it, and Photoshop it out and put it on a plate, and then have him sign maybe 100 or 200 or something, and then do yep. a different 
cover for the book like we do for our other books. We just did that with Dark Shadows, and we do it with a lot of different books. And I, I really want a, a limited edition Siberia of the first a volume of the Siberia years, and I want him to be around to see it because people mm. love the guy. And I just think he'd be very proud to see his stuff in this type yeah. of book. Yeah. Um, so that's something that is heavy on my mind based on what happened with Gil. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the book came out and Gil's widow, Elaine, was very proud of it. But then there it is. Um, Gil didn't get to see his book. And I don't want that to happen in this situation. So I think that yeah, is. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the reasons I asked that is because I'm not sure. I'm Probably sure you've seen that. That's what the uh, the Swedish no, not the Spanish, Spanish. dudes Dolman. have just uh, released Dolman, That's and cool. so they're doing basically copying your 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 uh, format way of doing it, formatting, and then it's the Cy Barry stories as well. And I know um, yeah. probably some of the people that have been helping you have probably helped them with this as well. And I, you know, this is a great book, but I can't read. You know, I can't read, well, I can't read Spanish. Let me, <laughs> let me tell you something really neat, is that we have all of the press proofs hmm. uh, from King Features for this. So we yeah. have possibly, yeah, we have possibly the most pristine material in existence that we're going to use to do the, the Siberia books. So, and the other thing is our formats, you know, people say, why don't you put three pictures, why don't you put three on a page? The answer is because I want to make them bigger. Yeah. And if I go through the page, I gotta make them smaller. Uh, yeah. And you know, I don't think anybody's gonna be disappointed with this. And it's also gonna follow in, in continuity because the whole point of what we're doing is that you can go into a library or somebody's house, and you will have the entire Phantom in a set of books that are completely consistent, and you can follow the entire canon yeah. of the Phantom, and it will preserve it so that it's always there. You know, it'll always yeah. be in, in a permanent in a permanent form because the books that the way I print my books, you know, you remember you remember that Twilight Zone episode, you know, where they blow up the world and the guy goes and gets all the books and then you yeah. know it's uh, just Meredith. I, I I hate that episode because <laughs> his glasses break and that's just so not he's a good guy. But you know, in in my version, he would have all the collected Phantom and his glasses wouldn't break <laughs> and he would. Get to be... Yes. <laughs> well. Um, I know I don't have all of them. I think I've, I've got probably about 90% of the, your stuff at the moment, uh, mainly because I'm waiting on Fans Vault to kind of get a few more of them in. Um, but on behalf of me, who, do, who does have majority of your work, um, I've very, very uh, appreciated the work that you guys have put into them. Um, I love the print quality. I love the clarity I love the passion that you guys have put into into your stories, into the hard covers. Um, I like the fact that you don't just uh, slap something together, but there's definitely um, attention to detail. Um, but you know, there's you've also kept that tradition alive as well. So, on behalf of myself, but also many others who are, who collect them as well, um, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate it. Um, I also look forward to what you're doing. Coming up with uh, the comic book series, I reckon. Um, I reckon once we get past these teething problems, I reckon. I, I reckon yous will uh, knock that out of the path as well. Um, and I'm looking forward to actually getting the Kennedy series in my in my hands as well, because uh, reading on the screen is not the same. No. Well, I th I thank you very very much. We do re we really appreciate that. We we really we work really hard on these things. Mm. And as you pointed out, we take this very seriously, if you can't yes. tell. You know, putting my thing aside, we take this extreme. We take all the books we do very, very seriously because I, I honestly believe that this is great. This is great material. These are great stories, whether it's Johnny Hazard or whether it's Brenda Starr or The Phantom or whether it's Roy Rogers or any of the strip or I, I did Mail Call or Mike Hammer. And I've, done, I've done many, 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 many. many Reprints. You're preserving history. That's exactly yeah. right. And we feel yeah. serious about it because we feel it's an important part of 20th century history, um, popular cultural history, which we believe is significant. And yes. we believe that this is the last shot 
that mm -hmm. that we're going to have it doing this because the material isn't going to exist anymore. It's just disappearing. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it just disintegrates, and yes. uh, and so I mean, you know, it, we're you know, we want people to inherit this stuff so that they can see how really special it was, yes. and it can be. And I yes. say that you know, I say that in all sincerity because if you don't have a mission when you're doing, a, you're your publisher. Publisher publishing companies have a mission. Serious ones do. They want to do certain things, and, and we have consistently done this because it's been my uh, it, it's been my driving force to do this, so that it'll be there when uh, you know when, uh, when 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 Burgess Meredith goes to read it, you know, when the world comes to it. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, and I, I really I appreciate the fact that 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 that, that you guys like it and, and and understand what we're doing, and that that means a lot to me. Thank. You. No worries, uh, Dan. Any final questions? Oh no, no more questions. Just to, just to reiterate what Jermaine said there about thank you for for the work that you do to preserve fandom history, and uh, you know so so many fans appreciate it. Um, I wish I could afford more of your products, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, no, just just fantastic. Thank you very much for it. and thank you for so much of your time tonight, both yes. both you, Dan and and Sabrina, because. Uh, you know the, the opportunity to talk to you and to um, to probe uh, all of the questions that uh, so many fandom fans have had, and to, to hear about your passion. And um, you know, I think you might have said in the first five minutes how anally retentive you were about doing this <laughs> properly. And um, you know, it, it, it's it, it's so much for the better for all of us. So thank you very much. Well, yeah, thank and you. you've been very candid with your uh, answers and, and and your time as well. And you know, we've we've asked you some. Some hard questions, I bet you've been very um, honest and very forthright. And so we appreciate your time. Yep. Uh, both of you, we appreciate um, all our emails, all the questions we ask you and stuff like that. Uh, we, you know, you probably you probably get sick and tired of seeing our names pop up in your email um, yeah. <laughs> email accounts. But um, no, we appreciate it a lot. Um, and yeah, and we've said it to everyone else. Uh, but if you ever need to use us as a channel. For any of your products or anything like that as well, we're more than happy to do so. Well, we're definitely taking we're, we're taking you up on that all the time. We <laughs> yes, have... yeah, good stuff. So um, yeah, thank you again for your time, um, and yeah, uh, just thank you. Well, our, our, our traditional sign off is to say, and I think it is, is appropriate to you guys as much as anybody. Happy phantoming, and uh, thank you for all the phantoming that you provide us. <laughs> well, okay. Well, as I was at, at, at this, as, as I always say, you know, at the end of my at the end of my YouTube, you know, that's all for now. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. All right, we'll cut the podcast there. Uh, yep. Thank you again, guys. Um, uh, yeah. How long was that? That was what two? Oh, we can keep going. Almost three that hours. Yeah. You still there, Jim? Yeah, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> that, um, you could tell within five minutes that we were going to go for over two hours. <laughs> yes. Um, we won't talk too long, so I think we'll sign off. Um, but how was that, Danny? Enjoy that? Did you learn stuff? Did you? Oh, did just it... the, I, I probably learned more about Hermes Press and the, 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 and Dan, the wide array of comics that he's into and, um, mm. And, and other other stories and that sort of thing. And clearly, you know, he said it a number of times, but clearly Phantom's a favourite. But, and, and again, as he said, I probably didn't appreciate the, the other variety of books that Hermes Press do and that sort of thing yeah. as well. Yeah. And then it was just interesting, like, learning. Well, I kind of knew a lot of about that, learning about the microfilm, the tear sheets and all this other type of stuff, just, you know, the technical type of stuff that, that goes in and then learning about how they had to you know, put three or four different panels and kind of merge them together. And, um, I enjoyed going through the first uh, Sync Brotherhood story and looking at yeah. all those panels and stuff yeah. like that. I don't think he had picked that up before either. I don't, to be honest, I don't think many people have picked that up, but it's been bugging me like, <laughs> ever since. Like, I picked this up back in like when they did the free one because those panels were exactly the same. Yeah. So I picked that up back in, like what, 
1996 or something like that. And um, what's that? 20, 20 odd years later, I still don't have a really an answer for it. So, um... <laughs> well, you've asked the expert. That's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. He should know more than me yeah. about that. So, um, yeah. So, um, now everybody, uh, obviously, website chroniclechamber.com. Uh, we'll have that up there. We'll have some of the panels that we were talked about in there, plus anything else as well, which will be on there. Uh, we've got the Reddit message board. You can email us on chroniclechamber at gmail.com. We have all our social media links, which is Facebook, Chronicle Chamber fan, fan page. Crikey, that's long. And Phantom Collector Group as well. Uh, Twitter, at Chronicle Tweets. Instagram, at Chronicle Chamber. Uh, and also, you can find all of us at iTunes uh, for your Apple device. And then if you're using Android, there's other ones like Podbean and and stuff like that as well, um, which do s- subscribe. Now, there's been some people that have been having some issues with um, listening to us, whether it's by iTunes or, or whatever. If you are one of those, drop us an email, chroniclechamber at gmail.com, or message us on Facebook. And to be fair, if they're, if they're struggling to hear us, they're probably not still tuned in at the uh, two hour 55 mark of, <laughs> of the podcast. Well, yeah, but I'm just letting people know that if you are having some troubles, let us know. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, Dan? Oh, uh, yeah, fantastic. I do, I like, it, I'm sitting here and I look at the clock and it's 2.08 a.m. and I've got work in, I've got to get up for work in four hours. But that's one of the things I love about Phantom Podcasting is uh, when, you, when you're talking to people overseas, you, you put in some late nights and, uh, uh, but do you, you just learn so much and to hear the passion of uh, of people and the you know yeah I mentioned it in the podcast but how how what a perfectionist he is at getting such a great product out for us and um, yeah maybe it takes longer than than people like but I have a feeling this art of the ghost who walks book is just going to be magnificent and uh, will be totally worth the wait so yes totally agree so um, from all of us. Happy Phantoming. Happy Phantoming, everybody.